Shalom, everybody. This is Malak Bamashai again at you on this new Shabbat. This Shabbat in the seventh month, Tishrai, Tashrai, I think he's here, uh, which is a very serious month, kind of like the first month of the year, where we have Abib and we have uh, Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits. Well, in this one, we have the uh, Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, which is Rosh Hashanah, uh, and uh, first day of the Feast of the Seventh Month. Happens right on the Shabbat. I mean, excuse me, on the new moon. This is, every new moon, you have a blowing of trumpets on the Hebrew calendar. You're supposed to blow the trumpets. But uh, on the first month, first day of the seventh month, it's called Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, or Feast of Shoutings. All right? It's a very special time. All of these feasts tell us something about what Yah is going to do in his in his, uh, his, redemptive, his redemptive role for Israel. You know? I wish I could say redemptive role for the whole world. But it, I would be lying to you. You know, lying through my teeth to say that he's redeeming the whole world. Now, technically we could say that he is redeeming the whole world. But the people that he's redeeming that incorporates the whole world is Israel. Whatever you have to do with Israel, if you, if you are serving Israel, if you are connected with Israel, then you have something to do with that redemption. Because Yahweh's his whole feast and all of these days as laws and all of that is for Israel. All right. It's not for other nations. Even though uh, I was taught that when I was involved in Christianity. And, uh, I don't like to say I'm involved with Christianity now. Because Christianity, obviously, is a pagan religion. All right. It's, it's no doubt about it. It's a pagan religion. Let's go to the scripture real quick. But we are in the Feast of Tishri. We've already had Feast of uh, Trumpets, Yom Teruah. And then we got Day of Atonement coming up here in a few days. We're on the eighth day of the calendar. Let's see here. Hold on just a moment. Eighth day of the month. Remember, the first day of, the, of every month is not, it's not uh, a working day. First day of every month is not a working day. It's, the, it's the, called the new moon day. So it's not counted as a working day. So you count the second day as the first working day of the month. So the, so on, after the sixth working day of the month, then you have the, you have the uh, Shabbat. So you don't just, you know, you don't just look at it like the Shabbat on every month is the seventh day of the month. It's the eighth day of the month because the first day of the month is not a working day. And there's a there's a law that says six days shall thy work and do all your labor on the seventh is the work is the, is the Shabbat. So when you have the first day of the month, he's not seeing that as the first working day. So you got to count working days until you get to the Shabbat. So the first Shabbat of every month is going to be on the eighth day. All right. Now we if we was in our original culture, that would be just the you know, but because we're not in our original culture and we've been in somebody else's culture in captivity, then we have Roman culture, as a matter of fact. We have to see it like that. We have to really expound about these days and why the calendar, and the calendar looks odd to us because we got a, we got a Roman calendar. All right. Let me see here. Let's put your... Let's let me see. 38. Just a moment. Let's be trying to find this scripture.
Yeah, it is. All right. So when he saves the whole world, his, all of his feast days have to do with his working for Israel. All right. It's not that he doesn't consider the other nations, but he considers the na other nations in regards to Israel. Is he going to, going to, is some people going to live forever with Israel that's of the other nations? I believe so. I, I think I quite, I'm quite sure they will. But this is, this is going to be a different world. That's even why it says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's going to be a different world than what it is now. All right, let me see. Psalm 147, verse 19. He showed up his word unto Jacob, his statutes and judgments unto Israel. He had not dealt so. Let me highlight that real quick. So you can see what I'm talking about right here. For those who can't hear that well, you need to see it. He had not dealt so with any nation. As for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise ye, Yahweh. You got to praise ye, Yahweh, right after this. <laughs> you know, some people might say, why did you laugh at that? I laughed at it because he, it said, praise ye, Yahweh, right there. And it's not even saying Yahweh. Guess what it's saying? Praise ye, Yah. Let me show you real quick. It's the same God, but Yah. Yeah, right here. I don't know. This might have something to do with the other type of Hebrew. Uh, what is it called? Uh, Yiddish Hebrew, y'all. Sounds country, doesn't it? The rest of the country, y'all. But I think it's yeah, like that. Yeah. Hold on just a moment. Let me know, y'all. How y'all? How y'all doing? No. I don't think it's like that. It's yeah. <laughs> like somebody speaking real loud and say, hey, you shut that noise up. Yeah. All right. Let me highlight that one more time. And I know y'all. How y'all doing? No, yeah. All right. Yeah, right there. All right. And then it's the meaning of the name. They've got ja. The J didn't come into the English language about four or five hundred years ago. So it's not Jah, or Jehovah, you know, the sacred name Jah, the Lord most vehement. Let me highlight that. He's not gonna be most vehement with y'all. <laughs> That's not most vehement. Yah is most vehement, all right? I heard some Hebrews say it really strongly. Hallelujah. All right. They got some pipes on them. They can really say it. Yah will be pleased. Most vehement. Okay. Hallelujah. I don't mean to bust your eardrums. <laughs> but anyway, let me read that again. He show up his word unto Jacob, his statutes and judgments unto Israel. He has not dealt so with any nation. So right there, it tells you something. Let me highlight that part right there. He has not dealt so with any nation, and he won't deal so with any other nation. All right? And this is the truth. You know, some people say, well, don't tell me the truth. No. We are anointed, and we're, we're servants of the truth. The ones that's ministering the truth is servants of the truth. That truth is Yahweh. He has not dealt so with any nation. That's where his judgments, they have not known him. And, and how you know is that the other nations haven't gone through what the Israelites have gone through. You know what I'm saying? Even the, uh, even the, when the Yahweh Shai was talking to the Jews in uh, Israel, and uh, he told them, he said, if you abide in my word, you shall remain free. Let me go there real quick so you can see what I'm talking about. I think that's John chapter 8. He said to the Jews that believed on him. Hold on just a moment. Okay, John chapter 8, verse 31. Yeah. Then said Yahweh Shai to the Jews, 
<clears throat> which believed on him. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. All right? So it's the truth that makes you free, no matter whether you want to hear it or not. The truth is a medicine. Some medicines taste nasty, all right? And, uh, but they heal. And so for some nations, this truth is not going to sound good for them. They used to being free. They used to the nations ruling over Israel, and they're going free. All right, but uh, in the kingdom that's coming, it's not going to be. It's not going to. It's like this kingdom here is not for everybody. All right, you can't tell me that this kingdom is for the Israelites or the people that were slaves for four hundred years, and still are being hung and still being oppressed, Jim Crow. All of that stuff going on. You can't tell me being killed in the street by the police. All right? Unarmed. You can't tell me this kingdom is for everybody. You know what I'm saying? On the bottom of the totem pole. All right? Uh, so in the kingdom that's coming, it's not going to be, not going to be everybody's, everybody's not going to be on the, top, on, the, on the top of the totem pole. And as a matter of fact, how was I said the first should be last and the last should be first in that kingdom? All right, but right here it says, you should know the truth and the truth shall make you free to these disciples that believed on him, to these Jews that believed on him. They, they answered and said, we be Abraham's seed and we're never in bondage to any man. How says thou you should be made free? Let me highlight that. Now, wait a minute. Now, your first thought should be if you know if you've been studying the scriptures for a while, if you haven't, that's a whole nother ball game. You know, Israel was in captivity to the Egyptians. And after they was in captivity to the Egyptians, the, the Canaanites wreaked, wreaked, the, wreaked, the, wreaked the havoc on them. Though they was in their own land, they was also subject to the Canaanites. They were subject unto the Assyrians. Bondage, they went, the whole northern tribes, 10 northern tribes, went into bondage to the Assyrians and never came back. And then the house of Judah went into bondage to the Babylonians. All right. And then to the Persians and Medes, then to the Greeks, they were in bondage to them. All right. Now you think about that, all of these times that Israel was in slavery or bondage, all right, throughout their history, who are these Jews that he's talking to right here? And he said to the Jews, those Jews was believed on them, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, we be Abraham, see, you weren't never, never in bondage to any man. How says thou, you should be made free. Now, right here, I know Yahawashai knew that they were Abraham's seed. So who are these Jews? All right. This is why you got to do a lot of study. You got to study in the Bible so you can get the full truth, the, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. All right. Because you study from somebody else's paradigm especially a people's paradigm that is related to these folks talking to Yahweh you would be confused the rest of your life. You would never come to the light. All right? That's even why these people won't have the kingdom. The kingdom, won't, they won't be on the top of the totem pole in the kingdom when Yah comes with his kingdom. Because they would never, they would never preach the truth. They prosper in a lie. But you know that there's people that prosper with lies. There's people whose whole constitution of their makeup as a nation that do better with the lie. They don't want the truth. The truth is not the truth to them. It's relevant. Truth is only relevant. That's how they come out with it. <laughs> All right. But they don't, they, they their whole constitution, they, they build empires on a lie. Tech and high tech empires with a lie. As a matter of fact, this world that we live in today, it's not built on the truth. But go outside and look at the cars, the airplanes, look at the technology, the uh, cell phone towers, all right? Look at all of that, the lights, uh, all of the technology. But that's built on mostly a lie, all right? Can you imagine what a, a world, an empire would look like built on the truth that Yah meant for it to be built on? 
you telling me that a lie is going to supersede the truth? All right. But these people will tell you, no, a lie is not greater than the truth. But they, <laughs> that's what they don't want the truth. What is that telling you? Now, let me read some more. It says, they answered him, said, we be Abraham's seed. And we're never in bondage to any man. Now, if you was, if you was Israel, if you was Jacob's seed, you were in bondage to the Egyptians, to the Canaanites, to the Assyrians, to the Babylonians, to the Greeks, to the Romans. Well, your whole history has been caught up into being a bondage, not, not free. You was only free for a little while with King David and Solomon. That was when you was really kind of scot free. But after King David and Solomon, if you were an Israelite from the house of Jacob, you had a whole history of constantly disobeying and God would punish you as his children. He would punish you with the with the with the with men, with the rod of man. He punished Israel with the rod of man. All right. So who are these people that was Abraham's seed, but were never in bondage like Israel? It had to have been Edom. Because when they came out of Babylon, when Israel, when the house of Judah came out of Babylon, they found Edom living in their land, the house of Judah's land. Now remember, Edom is, is Jacob's brother. Esau is Jacob's brother. And there is law that says you shall not abhor an Edomite because he is your brother. So they found the Edomites who basically helped the Babylonians find the Judites and take them into captivity. They found these same people living in their land. All right. And how did why they were living in their land? Because they were they had war with the Arabians. And the Arabians chased them out of their land, which was the land of Edom, Mount Seir and all of that. They chased them out of their land. They had to go into their brother's land and take up uh take up residence. So when they came home, they had to basically eventually take these Edomites into captivity and enforce them if they're going to stay in that land to be circumcised and keep the laws of, 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 of uh, Moses, the laws of Yahweh. All right? So you had two types of Israelites. You had Esau, the Edomites, and you had the Israelites living in the same land. All right? So we see this in the scriptures that there was a group of people, uh, theologians called the, uh, the Herodians. King Herod was an Edomite that the Romans put in charge over all the Israelites because the reason why they put Herod in charge because he was more like them. He was their brother. All right? That means the Romans were also Edomites. All right? The Romans were Edomites. Okay? But they, when they got control over the world, they left Herod as their vassal king over the nation. All right. So here it was Edomite. And so they had a group called the Herodians. All right. Not only was there, there were Edomites that were called the Herodians, but there was Edomites that were part of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the chief priest people. All right. So who do you think he was talking to right here? And they answered, say, we be Abraham's seed. That means, yeah, Abraham was of the descent. You notice they didn't say, but we be Jacob's seed, Israel's seed. They say, we be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How says thou, you should be made free? So these people that he's talking to right here were never in bondage. Okay? How wish I answered them, saying, verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committed sin is a servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore should make you free, you should be free indeed. And this what check this out. Yeah, I wish I knew who they were. All right, watch this. Hold on just a moment. Verse 37, I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. So this is what I was saying a little earlier, that the kingdom that's coming is not the kingdom of the whole world. It's the kingdom of Israel. All right, the whole world, most of the world that's not Israel, don't thrive on truth. All right, truth makes them a victim. 
So they they strive on whatever makes them on top. If it's the truth, then it, that puts them on top. They, then they strive for the truth. If it's a lie that puts them on top, then they strive for a lie, regardless of the truth. So whatever makes them be on top is what they strive for. Whether it's the truth or a lie, they, they go for either one of them. Whatever puts them on top. I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak that which we have seen with I speak that which I which I have seen with my father. You do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto, unto him, Abraham is our father. Yahweh said, said unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Abraham. If you was his children, you would do his works. Now Abraham did have some children that were not like him. All right. Every father has children that's not like him, pretty much. And then he has a child that is like him. You know? Every every father has children that are more like him than the others. But they're still his children. Obviously, Esau was a little different. Because the, in the book of the Esdras, second Esdras, it says, Esau is the end of the world that now is. But Jacob is the beginning of that which comes afterwards. So the end of this world is Esau. Edomite is the Edomite world. He's the end of the, this whole world. So when people talk about when is the end of the world, the end of the world is when Esau is done, when, he, when he's down, when he can't rule anymore, when he's defeated. That's the end of the world. But what comes after that, that world, is Jacob, is the kingdom, is the kingdom of Yahweh, the kingdom of Yah. So it is, the earth won't cease to exist. But this world, which is not the earth, the world system will cease to exist. The world system that most of us, all of us pretty much in this world have only known this world. The world that's, that's, that's striving and running and ruling and everything. That's all we know. We never, we, we weren't back in the days to see King David and Solomon, the reign over the world. All right, we didn't see that. We hear about it, we read about it. So what we see is Esau's world that's out there ruling and reigning and Yah is giving it time to do so. Yah has basically allowed them to rule and reign up until this point in time. Let's see what this says right here. Yah was I said unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. So Abraham was a faithful man. He was not a man that just only loved whatever puts him on top. If it's a lie, then he lies. If it's the truth, then he tells the truth. He was not like that. But now you seek to kill me, a man that have told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This is this did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they unto them, we be not born of fornication, because they didn't know what he was talking about. He talking about your father. Like, Our father's Abraham is what they're saying. But he told him, he said, you do the deeds of your father. Then said they unto him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Uh-oh, they brought God in him too. Yahweh said unto them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I, I perceived forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Now, many people see God as, you know, this, this image that we see on TV. Because remember, it says that Yahweh was the express image of the Father. So we see this image that they put on TV that we think is, is the Son of God. Ever since I was a kid, there was a picture. Of, I had, We had pictures in the house, too, of the Son of God. He had stringy long hair, a beard, blue eyes, pale skin. All right? And I think we even had one of those pictures where you turn one way, you see one thing, you turn the other way, you see another thing. Those pictures that change depending on where you're viewing it from. The picture of the, I think everybody's seen this picture of your know, Jesus or white Jesus knocking on the door. And the door, he cannot, there's no latch on the outside. You can only open it up from the inside, but he's knocking, in, knock, knocking on the door with no latch to open the door up. So you had to open it up from the inside. Well, that, I, that's what I saw as a kid. And, we, and I lived in all Chocolate City, Gary, Indiana, as a kid. All right? Where the Jacksons and them lived not too far away from us, blocks away. 
That's where I grew up at, you know, from a kid. But uh, but the image that we see on TV, you got the whole world deceived. That this father that Yahweh is talking about, which he's a splitting image of, all right? They don't love him. If they found out who he is and what he looks like, I, I pretty much believe that many people would stop being what they call believers in the Bible. All right? If they wouldn't know what God really looked like, they, they right off the top, they might become his enemy. They might become atheists because they don't like the way God looks. It's not that God is not handsome or beautiful or anything, that, but that, that might be the problem. But he's not one of them, all right? <laughs> that might be the issue. He's not one of them, and he's beautiful, okay? That might tear them up, all right? The Bible says that they had envy against the children of Israel, the house of Esau. But he's going to judge them about that envy. I always had said unto them, God, will your father, you love me? For I perceive it both came from God, and neither came out of myself, of myself, but he sent me. So Yahweh is not God, but he was sent by God. And we see in the scriptures, like I said a little earlier, that he is the express image of Yahweh's person. That means he's a stamped image. Like you see coins minted. You look at one coin, you see the other coin, they, they meant it from the same press. They look just exactly alike. All right. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Here's the biggie right here. John 8, 44, this is one of my scriptures I remember. If I even knew a lot about what I know now when I was a young man, you have your father the devil. That's, that's what he tells me. You have your father the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and a bold not in the truth. Because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. Because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinces me of sin? And if I say, I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God hear God's words. You therefore hear them not, because you're not of God. See? So what we were saying earlier, that this kingdom that's coming is not an Edomite kingdom. The world that we that's running the, the people that's running the world today, when the kingdom comes, they will not be running the world. They will not be on top. First, the first will be the last, and the last should be first. But who do you think is going to be on top of the world? These people that Yahweh was really of. We see in the scriptures that Yahweh doesn't look anywhere like Caesar's. Okay? We see that in the scripture of Revelation. We see it in the book of Daniel. These people are not anywhere like that. All right? Um, but let's go on. The kingdom that's coming is going to be beautiful. All right? And the nations that do survive are the ones that's going to be serving Israel. The ones that survive are going to serve Israel. The ones that don't survive would be the ones that say, no, I'm not serving Israel. Get it? <laughs> All right. Well, the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, they should be utterly wasted. All right. Don't make me have to show it to you on the scripture up here. You, people that I talk to, I talk to people like as if they read the Bible through and through a few times. All right, those are the people I normally talk to, but some people are smart enough to catch it. Know that those are scriptures. It's in the Bible somewhere. But a nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, they should be utterly wasted. All right. He's going to do the same thing he did with Egypt. He destroyed Egypt to get his people out of there. In the latter days, he's coming again to, to do a similar work. All right. He's going to destroy the world, the nations, to get his people out of there. Even the people that are rebellious, he's going to take them out of there, too. He took everybody out of Egypt. He's going to take everybody out of uh, this system that we're living in today. And that's how you would know who's your Israelite and who is not. All right. But he's coming for those people. Remember, there's a song, I think, by Dallas Holmes. 
I'll, I'll rise, I'll come again, I come to take my people back. You know, he's coming to take his people back. Right now, he's allowed them to be under the hands of, of the oppressor. Simple. But these people that Yahweh was talking to were not those people, even though they went up under the name Jews. Okay? So there was Jews, there was of Edom, Jews of, the, of Jacob. So you can see that, that little war again between Jacob and Esau. You still see it today. Now, like I was saying earlier, today is the eighth. Let me see if I can find something for you real quick. Today is the eighth. So on the ninth, let me see. Uh, let me go up here to Leviticus and show this to you. On the ninth, that evening, we will have the, the beginning of the Day of Atonement, whereby you're supposed to afflict your souls. All right? Now, can people that are not Israel do these things? Yes. Can people that are not Israel keep the Shabbat? Yes. Can people that are not Israel be born again and saved and filled with the Holy Spirit? Yes. All right. I know that there's a lot of people that will tell you that the Edomites and none of the other folks can be saved or born again. I'm a bit different on that. All right. But I do see in the in the scripture speaking on that there's going to be a certain few people that's not going to have mercy in the latter days. All right, and you know who that is, right? Esau. Because of what they did to Jacob. Do it. Is there some, probably some, uh, some exceptions to the rule? You know, I see in one place where it says Esau will not have a cornfield, much of a cornfield in the latter days. And I see it's another version of the same scripture says there will be none remaining of the house of Esau. I see that in the scripture it says they will call. His, his princes to the kingdom. There would be none. So what's going on there? I'm going to put it this way. And be straight up with you, tell the truth. Um, I wouldn't want to be Esau in the latter day. Right? And, if, and if I was Esau, I'd be looking forward to being an exception to the rule. All right? I'd be stressing and pressing in to be the exception. That, that my people get cut off all 100%, almost 100% of them get cut off. I won't get cut off. All right? Leviticus 23, 26, and Yahweh speaking to Moses saying, and also on the 10th day of this month, the seventh month, there should be a day of atonement. There should be an holy convocation unto you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire. When you afflict your soul, we know it as fasting. That's how you afflict your soul, to fast. You should, you should do no work in that self-same day, in that same day, for it is a day of atonement. To make an atonement for, for you, for you before your hour, your Allah. For whatsoever soul that it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he should be cut off from among his people. Now, when Yah comes and gets his people out of the nation, he's taking them back to the wilderness again, like he did in the first place. And the book of Ezekiel says he's going to take them to the wilderness, Ezekiel 20, and uh, they won't reside in the nations that he can, he's going to take them out of. Hold on just a moment. He's going to take them to the wilderness, and they won't enter into the land of Israel. So the only ones coming into the land of Israel are the ones that are not rebels. I remember in the Old Testament, when he was dealing with Israel in the wilderness with Moses, he, com he complained about them being a stiff neck and a hard hearted people. They were stiff neck and rebellious, put it that way. So there's going to be some stiff neck and some rebellious again in the latter day. The ones that are stiff neck and rebellious will be, they will come out of the lands when Yahweh brings us all out, but they won't enter into the land of Israel, so they will be left. I don't know, the scripture doesn't say whether he's going to kill them or not. But they will be cut off right here where we see that uh, the, the, the soul that would not be afflicted, he should be cut off from among his people. Let's see what that cut off is, 3772. Let's take a look real quick. Sometimes it looks like cut off means killed. You know, you would perish. Sometimes it means you would not 
be allowed to be among the people, which basically would be in that day killing because if you're meant to be with these people and you're not, and you're with the nations that are outside of Israel, all right, uh, that might mean that you're going to die. Primitive root to cut off, offer down or asunder by implication to destroy or consume, specifically to covenant, that is to make an alliance, a bargain originally by cutting flesh, passing between the pieces. So right here it says to consume, destroy, or consume. All right, to destroy or consume. All right. Let's take some more looks at this day of atonement because this is going to be on the ninth day at evening until the tenth day. Whatsoever soul that do of any work in that self same day, the same the same soul will I destroy from among the people. All right. That right there, destroy means uh, not all the time does it mean killing. Destroy, destruction. It's kind of like what happened to our people over the last few hundred thousand years. We've been destroyed, but we're still alive, right? I mean, probably Abad is the name of that word for destroy. Uh, there's a word in Revelation, I think Revelation chapter 9 or 10, that uh, an angel of the abyss, his name is Ab Abaddon, Abaddon in Hebrew. So I mean, he's, a, he's, a, he's a destructing, destruction angel, the angel of the bottomless pit, the, the angel of destruction. Abad right here is the name of to wander away that is lose oneself by implication to perish, uh, destroy, break, destroy. So when it says that they will put a yoke of iron on, on the Israelites' neck so they destroy them, that doesn't mean exactly that Israel will be totally destroyed and perish. It means that they will, they will be destroyed from their heritage. Now, in this situation, I would I would believe that he's talking about that they would not only be destroyed from their heritage, they would be they would die. But whatsoever soul that be that doeth any work in the self same day, that same soul will I destroy from among the people. And we see this, we see him do this destroying and killing a man with stones in the wilderness, but gathering stone, gathering sticks on the Sabbath. All right. You shall do no manner of work, and shall be a statue forever throughout your generation and in all your dwelling. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and shall afflict your souls. All right? Now, here's the key. All right? Here's the problem that most of us have. Highlight it real quick. All right. So we don't have animals to sacrifice anymore. You know, the house I took care of that. So what we have is affliction with fasting that we do. Right? In the ninth day, of the month at evening, and even the evening, so you celebrate your Shabbat. Now, here's the reason why many people do Shabbat from evening to evening. All right? From evening to evening. And they find some more scriptures in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, to, to support their cause. Let's look at that word, even. But, uh, I think they need to study a little bit more on that. 6153 in the Hebrew from evening. It's got to be the word ered. Yep. All right. That means ered. Let me highlight it real quick. This is how you say it. Ered. Some people that do, pay, uh, do what is it called? Uh, the other Hebrew. I just mentioned the name of it. Uh, Hebrew that's from Germany or whatever. Um, they say Ara, Ara, Ara with a V. But I said before that really in Paleo Hebrew, there's no V. And the E and the I and all of that. The I is, is sound, is, you say I in Hebrew, that's how you say it. I, I am, is the name of the letter. But most of the time when you see uh, the vowels in the Hebrew, it's an I sound. 
uh, short A or long A, not long A, but a short A, ah, says Arab. Arab would be the evening. And it's not the absence of sunlight, it's dusk. Yeah, I like that real quick. When the sun goes over the horizon, you can still see light in the sky. As a matter of fact, you still think it's still sunshine and outside to a certain degree. But the sun is one over the horizon. All right. And it's dust. All right. So from dust to dust, even from to even, she can celebrate your Shabbat. But like I said, many people think that every day is with Yah from evening to evening. All right. And it can't be. The reason why I say that because he made the light, made the day, he called the light day and the darkness he called night. And Light is the absence of darkness. Darkness is the absence of the light. And he separated the night from the day, the light from the darkness. All right? This is dusk. There's no separation of light and darkness right here. All right? So when Yah says the day is the Sabbath day, the Sabbath is not a Sabbath night. You never hear him calling Sabbath night, right? You never hear that in the scripture because the Sabbath ain't at night. Okay? Nighttime in Hebrew culture was the time when, about time you get ready to go down and lay down in the bed. There was no working in Hebrew culture at night. Even Yahweh said, if a man walks at night, he does not know what he stumbles over. So that in that culture, there was no working at night. Today, in this culture we live in, there's sunlight, there's lights outside and everything. And the car got light on them. But you got to remember how Yah originally meant it for this to be. That there was no day from evening to evening. The Shabbat starts at, and when, it, when the sun comes up. When is the Shabbat, Shabbat in? When the sun is down, that means when it's a red, not a red, excuse me. It's called Lila. Night is called Lila in the Hebrew. When we say good night in Hebrew, you say Lila Tov. All right? When you say good evening, Arab Tov. Day is Yom Tov. All right? But Yah separated the night from the day. So Yah, the Yah, because of this, because of the, the Day of Atonement, make every day even to even? No. He just said from the from the even to even, so you celebrate what Sabbath? This Shabbat. He didn't say from even to even, so you celebrate every Shabbat. All right? Not, not every Shabbat is celebrated from evening to evening, but the Day of Atonement. That's why he just mentioned it right here on the Day of Atonement. He didn't mention it for, for, uh, for what is it called? The first day of the month, Yom Teru, uh, Rosh Hashanah. Nor did he mention it for any other day, celebrating it from a uh, holy day or Shabbat from evening to evening. Only right here. All right? And it says, by the testimony of two witnesses shall every word be established. You cannot establish a testimony where he, where he said another Shabbat day in the scriptures is celebrated from Arab to Arab, evening to evening. So the, so the Sabbath day, you notice it didn't say Sabbath night, Sabbath day is from the morning when the sun starts coming up until the sun is totally out of the sky. Not when it arrived, not when it just goes over the horizon, but when it's totally dark. The Shabbat is over. And that's the reason why it says that Yahweh bought Israel out of Egypt at night. Let me show that to you. Why did he bring them out of Egypt at night? Let me see. Sometimes people, you know, folks that don't want to hear this, they hear it with something they don't want to hear. And when it's, when it's time for them to really believe the truth, all right, then they remember somebody said that in the time. I, I get it now. All right, let me see here. Bottom out of Egypt at night. Deuteronomy 16 Observe the month of Abib and keep the Passover unto Yahweh the Allah. For in the month of Abib, let me highlight this Yahweh the Allah brought forth, brought thee forth out of Egypt, what by night. 
Let me highlight this real quick. So it was not on the Shabbat day, or because remember they they the Passover lamb at night, right? Did they leave that night? No. They didn't leave that night. Because they was going toward the morning when all of this stuff had everybody they realized that was not a house in Egypt, but that was not a dead body. Because they killed all the firstborn. All right. It was during the day they sent somebody to Moses and said, get the heck up out of here and bless me also. <laughs> Take your animals and everything. Get out. Just go. Moses said, go and borrow stuff from the Israelites, I mean, from the Egyptians. Gold, silver, clothes. And they was willing to give Israel whatever they would ask for. And they really didn't have that borrow because all of the stuff that they worked, their, their labor got them the stuff. Yah knew he said command them to borrow from the Egyptians. He knew they was not going to pay it back as it's only part of their reparations. All right. But observe the month of Abib and keep the Passover unto Yahweh the Alahim for in the month of Abib. And this is the first month of the year, not the seventh. Abib is the first month, which is back in April, sometime around that area. Or yet in the month of Abib, Yahweh the Alahim brought thee forth out of Egypt by night. Let's take a look at this word night. Is it lila by chance? Or is it a red? So it was on the feast. It was the feast of uh, unleavened bread, which is the day right after Passover, which is a Sabbath. But they came out of Egypt on. But what was they doing? Leaving Egypt and working and walking on the Shabbat. All right, they could not have left on that Shabbat because the next day. He's in the living bread. They'd be walking, struggling on that Shabbat. And that was a holy day for Yah. 30, Hebrew 39, 15. Ah, there it is. Lila. So why did they come out? Why didn't they come out on a, a red? Why didn't he bring them out of Egypt on a red in the evening? Because that day that they left, was the feast of the feast of unleavened bread? The first day of the feast of unleavened bread, as a matter of fact. All right, the first day and the last day of the of unleavened bread is a is a Shabbat. Lila, let me see. I'm gonna highlight it. It's basically how you say it in Hebrew. This is how you mostly say it. Lila. So that's total darkness. From the same as Hebrew 3883, probably a twist, a way of delight. That is night, frigatory adversity, night season, midnight. Right here, see that midnight. That means there's no light in the sky, there's no dusk. All right. Let me highlight that real quick for you. Midnight. I had a friend that I led to Yahweh. His nickname was Midnight. He was very dark. All right. Midnight. So that's Lila. So what did he bring him out on? What day did he bring Israel out of Egypt on? He, he punished Egypt on Passover. And remember, they was to stay in. They was not to come out at their houses until the morning. All right. So, so they had to stay in his, Egypt until the morning, at least, of, of Passover. And that and that morning of Pass, at, at the Passover was over with was the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It was a holy day. So they still didn't work on that day, and Pharaoh sent to them to get, get up out of Egypt. So what happened? Moses and them waited till Lila of that day, that holy day. He waited till not the daytime, till the nighttime. Because it was not the Shabbat anymore at night. Guess that? I hope you're seeing that. It was, not, it was no longer uh, uh, the day, the Shabbat day. It was no longer the holy day. It was night. All right? So he brought him out of Egypt. Let me read that again. Brought him out of Egypt at night. So they waited till the day of Feast of Eleven Bread. They didn't work. They didn't leave Egypt at that time. They waited till night because it was no longer Shabbat. 
for some people. <laughs> you listen to some of our some of our people today, and some people of other nations, and say that they were supposed to wait until the morning of the next day, or the evening, or whatever. There's some messed up ideas about this, but I used to be the same way. I'm not gonna laugh too hard on it. I used to think that they, that they, we tried it, my wife and I, even in the evening. But right here, they came out of Egypt at night. Why? Because they celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread. When they left, that bread still hadn't, what is it called? The, they still hadn't uh, leavened. So they left with unleavened bread at night, the nighttime of the first feast day of the unleavened bread. Now, the terminology day can mean a 24-hour period. But on this feast day of unleavened bread, to show you that Passover, well, I guess you can come up whatever you want to believe, but if you look at it correctly, they left on the night after the feast of unleavened bread was over with. All right, day, the daytime was over with, put it that way, all right? It's up to you to study and find it out for yourself. The Bible does say to study the plan, show yourself approved under God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Hold on just a moment. I'm gonna check this out again. Not what I'm studying, like as if I'm just now learning. There's a particular person that I was waiting to be on here. I want to make sure that I, I send him a message. All right, hold on. Yep. All right. So at evening on the ninth day, because where, where are we at right now? We're on the eighth day. So that means tomorrow, which is, what is that, uh, Saturday? So the evening of Saturday, which is a pagan pagan name, Saturday. Evening of tomorrow, tomorrow evening, which is called Saturday by this culture. At evening, before the sun gets all the way down, when it goes over the horizon, when it gets dusky out, that's when you afflict your soul. You don't eat anything until the next evening. All right? That's how you do that. All right. Is that all that Day of Atonement means? Well, let's go somewhere real quick. Let's go to, let's go to, let me see here. Where's my cruiser? There it is. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 25. We're going to get, we're going to, well, let's go to Leviticus 16 first, because that's more about the, the what goes on on the Day of Atonement. Then we'll go to Leviticus 25. All right, as you can see, at the top it says Day of Atonement. Let me highlight it for you. So Leviticus 16 is what happens, what they did on the Day of Atonement. All right. Highlight it. Day of Atonement. Verse 1. Yahweh spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered before Yahweh and died. If you don't know what happened, the two sons of Aaron saw some stuff that was miraculous to them and they wanted to worship God. They didn't they didn't go by what Yah's commandments was. They grabbed, they went and grabbed some censors off of the off of the altar. And offered strange fire before Yahweh, they thinking it was worshiping, kind of like the guy that touched the Ark of the Covenant. That when David and then was bringing it up from uh, from uh, the Philistine, he touched it. Uh, Uzzah touched the Ark of the Covenant and died. Well, this kind of what happened with Aaron's sons. They were supposed to be priests, but two of them died, and they, only two of them survived. They offered before Yahweh strange fire, and Yah had not commanded, and immediately that fire came down from heaven and consumed. 
they, they didn't totally take them out to someone like where they they didn't exist, their bodies didn't exist. They burnt, they were burnt to a crisp. All right. And then he told Aaron, no, don't you cry right now. <laughs> don't you cry. All right. So Yah could be cold blooded. He can he could be someone else. And David was upset with Yah for allowing Uzzah to die, a touch an ark of the covenant. He was upset with Yah. All right, which goes to show you that this God, if you have the nations, don't play with him. If you have Israel, don't play with him. All right? Don't play with him. I don't care who you are. Don't play with this God. Now, this God is the most joyful being that ever had existed and will exist. But when it comes to seriousness and obedience and death and life, don't play with him. Take him serious. Take him at his word. Verse one, Yahweh spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they when they offered before Yahweh and died. And Yahweh said unto Moses, speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the vow before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. So he's telling Aaron, you know not to offer strange fire before me, but that that ark, that uh that veil that's that separates the most holy place from the holy place. Don't come in that, that within that veil at all, at all times, because you will die too if you come in there without the proper, without the proper instruction. All right, let me read that again. Speaking to Aaron, thy brother, that he come not at all times to the holy place within the veil, before the mercy seat. So right there is telling you that not everybody can stand before God and look at him in the face. As a matter of fact, Moses asked to see his glory, and he told Moses by standing there talking to him face to face. No one can see my face and live, but I will allow you to see my back parts. And he did. And what is that? Exodus uh, 34, Dre? Hello? I think it's Exodus 34. She's speaking to my son, but he's he's on the vacation right now. But uh, <laughs> uh, I think it's Exodus 34 where y'all come down and let him see the back parts. Couldn't see him in the face, but he descended, Yah descended in the cloud, stood next to Moses, and then proclaimed the name of Yahweh, and Yahweh came by in the sky. When he did, when he when you could see his face, he put Moses in a cleft of a rock, and with his hand, while he was going by, he hid him. So he could not see his face. When he turned around, when he went by, you could see his back parts. That's when he took his hand off of the cleft of the rock, and Moses saw the behind parts of Yahweh. All right, but uh, to see Yah in his glory, you would die. Most men would die. All right, and I wanted to say something. Can I say it? Yeah, can I say it? I think the only one that would not die to see Yah in the face, I think the only one that's not going to die to see Yah in the face as a human being is Yah himself. The one that basically stood next to Moses and proclaimed the name of Yahweh that descended in the cloud. And his name was Yahweh too. It says Yahweh descended and he proclaimed the name of Yahweh and Yahweh passed by. The same way when he went into eat, when he went into Sodom and Gomorrah, and he saw that the Sodomites were intent upon raping some angels. When he bought Lot and his wife and his and his two daughters out, all right, it says that Yahweh rained fire from Yahweh rained fire from Yahweh in heaven upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Look at that. Yahweh that was that bought them out, holding their hands, bringing them out of Sodom. Rain fire upon Sodom and Gomorrah from Yahweh in heaven. So that was Yahweh that was on the earth, helping Lot get out of Sodom. And he rained fire from Yahweh in heaven. Now many people say, see there, I told you there's a trinity. No, there's not a trinity. It's the same Yahweh. All right. It's just that Yahweh can be in one more than one place at the same time. All right. So what, that's what happened here when Yahweh that that when Moses could talk to him face to face, that Yahweh Yahweh basically lowered himself, put it that way. He humbled himself so Moses could talk to him. All right, and we, I guess we'll talk about how he did that later on some other time. But how the Yahweh that Moses could not see in the face and all his glory. I, I guess it's simple. Let's go like this. The, the, the Yahweh that Moses was talking to and face to face was not in all his glory. That's simple. He he was he he humbled himself and made himself to where Moses could see him without dying. 
Okay. But the Yahweh that passed by in the sky, that's him and that's him in his full glory. Because that was the question Moses asked, show me your glory. Okay. So this is the reason why he's telling Aaron, don't come in at all times within that veil, you know, from the holy place. Because it's called the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was at. See that you do not do that lest you die, lest you die not, for I will appear in a cloud upon the mercy seat. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on a holy linen coat. I'm telling you right now that linen, you want some good clothes, and I'm I'm planning on changing my wardrobe and apparel over time. But the linen is is the, the frequencies of linen through your body is healthy for your body. Now cotton is too, but the but the most hope, most healthy garment for your body is linen. Whether it's shirt, pants, underwear, socks, jacket, robe, the most whole, most the most healthy garment for your body is linen. Study that on your own. Study it and check it out and see. He shall put on a holy linen coat and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh. So he had underwear, breeches, underwear, which kind of like pants, all right? Uh, what do they call them? Holes, hoses, and certain other scriptures. I think the Israelites, the three Hebrew boys, had on hoses. Hosen is what they call it. But it's pants, but they were really for underwear, kind of like boxers or whatever we wear today. All right. Linen breeches upon his flesh and shall gird with a linen girdle. All right. That means a, a belt across the midsection is a girdle. Uh, you know, we call it a belt today with a linen miter, which is a, basically some covering his head, a uh, uh, headband. Shall, be, uh, shall he be attired? These are holy garments, therefore shall he wash his flesh in water and put them on. He should take off the he should take up the congregation of the children of Israel, two kids of the goats, for a sin offering and one for a burnt offering, a ram, excuse me. Two kids of the goats for a sin offering, and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock for a sin offering, which is for himself and make an atonement for himself and for his house. So Aaron the priest, before he did the atonement for Israel, he had to make sure he was right first. All right. He had to make sure he was good. All right. And for him and his household. For himself. Should he make an atonement for himself and for his house? So verse seven. Let me pull this up here a little bit more. And he shall take up the two goats and present them before Yahweh at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, the reason why I just said a little bit ago that only Yah himself can see himself face to face, all right? Uh, you're going to see what I'm talking about in a second or two, because I'm going to be honest with you, I never heard nobody talk this, say what Yah has given me to speak on this topic. I never heard nobody else, but I haven't been searching out there too much either. But I, you know, as far as in the Christian sphere of those that believe in Yahweh Shai as the Messiah, all right, that because you believe in Yahweh as Messiah doesn't mean you're in a Christian sphere, but it does put us in a Christian area, in a Christian neighborhood to believe that, because most of the Christians believe that Yahweh is the Messiah, and they've taken over the world. All right, <laughs> the Christians that believe that Yahweh is the Messiah have taken over the world. That's, that's what's running the world out there. In other words, the Edomites that believe that Yahweh is the Messiah run the world. Okay, let me go on. All right. He should take out the two goats and present them before Yahweh at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats. One lot for Yahweh and the other lot for the scapegoat. I've heard many people talk about the scapegoat. I've heard some stories and a half about this thing. You know, <laughs> what they would do. They would take the scapegoat to a hill and kick him off the hill. Oh, oh my goodness. No, they didn't do that. We'll see what they did. All right, and Aaron should cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for Yahweh, and the other lot for the scapegoat. All right, and Aaron shall bring the goat upon which Yahweh's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. Now, I don't know about you, I'm gonna read that again. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which Yahweh's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. 
That sounds like your house. I'm gonna be honest with you. Now we know your house is called the Lamb of God. But the sin offering is goat being offered for a sin offering. There's two goats. One, one is called the scapegoat, one is Yahweh's goat. This Yahweh's goat sounds like Yahweh's goat. For a sin offering at that. All right. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat. Now here's like here's, here's here's the gitter right here. This is this is important. Now the the Yahweh being the sin offering is important. But the but the scapegoat that's gonna be the what is it called? Well it does let me let me just read it real quick. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat, all right, shall be presented alive before Yahweh. What is he gonna be presented alive before Yahweh to do? To make an atonement. Let me highlight that, to make an atonement. So the whole thing about the atonement is not about the goat for the sin offering. All right, let me highlight this real quick. So this is important. Like I said, I haven't heard too many people say this and learn this or speak on this. And I haven't listened to everybody. But the doctrine of this doctrine I'm talking about is not out there big time. All right. The goat that's called the scapegoat is the one that make an atonement. What is this day called? It's called the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. You would think the goat that represents your Hawashai for the sin offering would be the goat for the atonement. All right? But it's not saying that. It's saying, let me read that again for the goat for the sin offering. Aaron shall bring the goat upon which your house lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. It didn't say it was for the atonement. So look at everything that Yah says and every idol, look at everything that he says, everything is perfectly put in there. It's not like he forgot to say, oh, I forgot to tell you that the code for the sin offering is for the atonement. My bad. No, that's not that's not how Yahweh is. He's perfect. Okay? But the goat on which the lot failed to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before Yahweh. Notice it said he would be presented alive. Before who? Before Yahweh. And remember, no one should see my face and live. Think of that again. So Moses, Moses said, Show me your glory. Now we know that the sin offering goat is basically symbolic, is a symbolism of Yahweh. All right. These are human beings that's going on that's being symbolized by goats. All right. Yahweh was a human being, wasn't he? Now there was a time I used to think Yahweh was Yahweh himself, you know, coming out of Christianity and all of that. I thought he was God and he was Yahweh. All right. The one that told me that he was not was Yahweh Shai himself. Or well, if I've had some visitation from Yahweh Shai. More on more than one occasion. Uh he no, he just talking and thought he saw Yahweh. No, I saw I saw Yahweh Shai. Excuse me, I, I said Yahweh, but yeah, I saw Yahweh Shai. Okay. Saw him on more than one occasion, so I know what he looks like. Okay. Nabby ear and all. <laughs> so Aaron should bring the goat upon which your house lot failed and offering for sin offering. But the goat on which the lot failed to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before your house. So the scapegoat is a person. He's going to be presented alive before Yahweh. Why? To make an atonement with him and let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. And I, like I said, it's funny. I've heard people say what they would do in the ceremony. They would start a fit man would take the scapegoat out there as far as he could take him and push him over a ledge where he would fall down and die. That's not what the scripture says. It says you should let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. And they say kick him over a ledge of a cliff so he would die. Because he's going to be presented alive before your house. The key word here is alive. Let me go back to that to that word alive real quick. Because maybe we can look it up real quick. 24, 24, 16. Okay, hold on. And there's, here's, I'm telling you something. Like I said, that most Bible scholars and most Bible teachers won't teach you. And I'm surprised at it. I, I've been surprised at it for quite a while. 
all right? That is not the one that's the sin offering that's presented alive that's for the for the atonement of Israel. It's the scapegoat that 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 uh makes the atonement. Let's look at that 2416. Kahi is for that word alive. So it means alive, hence the raw flesh, fresh, plant, water, strong, also as a noun, especially in the feminine, singular, masculine, plural, life, a living thing, whether literally or figurative, age, alive, appetite, wild beast, company. Kind of, you get the idea. Somebody's going to be presented alive that won't never die before Yahweh, and he's the scapegoat that goes into the wilderness. Let's read that again. You need to, to make an atonement with him and let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. And Aaron shall bring the bullock for the sin offering, which is for himself and make an atonement for himself and for his house. He shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. And she make, he shall take a censer and full of burning coals of fire from the altar before Yahweh and, and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small. I tell, I'm telling you, when Aaron made that golden calf, God made him pay for that. He made him pay for making that golden calf. <laughs> oh my goodness. He had to, he had to, he had to front that as long as he lived, going into that holy of holies and not dying, making sure he was right. <laughs> Let me stop laughing at this. All right. He should take a sense of full of burning coals of fire from all. The altar before you how when his hands full of sweet incense beating small and bring it within the veil. So he's going within that veil. <laughs> All right. And from what I hear, yeah, they would tie a rope around priests. Because if he died in there, they couldn't nobody could go in that, that holy of holies after him. So what they would do, they pull him out with that rope, you know. <laughs> they would not go in there. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Especially after seeing Aaron's two other sons get burned to a crisp. They were not going into that Holy of Holies. They tied a rope around him. So if he, did, he was not right. He did something wrong up in there and yeah, killed him. They were not going in there to get killed too. They pulled, they, they, they would drag him up out of there. All right. <laughs> but anyway, it's not funny. You know, life is serious. But Yah made him pay for that building that ark, that golden calf. And say I threw the gold in there and I'll king this calf. Okay, you said that? Okay, you're gonna be the high priest. You Moses' brother too, you're gonna be the high priest of my people in this covenant. Because remember, Yah at the very beginning did not choose Aaron the Levites to be the priest. He was meaning for all Israel to be Melchizedek priests. The whole nation was gonna be a kingdom of priests. But when they sinned and broke the covenant that Yah made with them, then Aaron became the high priest until the one would come that would take that sin away so where we could go back to being the Catholic priest. I hope you heard that. So Yahweh Shai is our chief priest, our chief Melchizedek priest. So the one that would come that would take that sin away. What sin was that? Adultery, spiritual adultery that Israel committed on Mount at Mount Sinai after they made the covenant with Yahweh. They made the covenant and Yahweh came down on a, on a sapphire stone in Exodus chapter 24. They established the covenant and had a covenant confirming meal, which would be symbolic, kind of like the, 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 the marriage supper of the lamb. Had a covenant confirming meal and Yah came down and had a sapphire stone up under his feet. All right. But after that is when they made that, that, that burnt, that, that calf and committed adultery. All right. But Yah was meaning for us to be a Melchizedek priesthood back then. And now he had to wait until someone would come. That was Yahweh. That was in his plan. Yahweh would come and take that sin away by his own body, by his own sacrifice. Many people think Yahweh is God. I, like I said, I did too. But he was the lamb to take away that sin to bring us back to Melchizedek priesthood. Remember when they made the, the covenant, 
there was no Aaronic priesthood. It was just young me and there were priests that bought it, that sacrificed the, the 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 what is it the bulls and bought the blood and the basins. All right, but anyway, he shall put the incense upon the fire before Yahweh, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony, that he died not. So the altar of incense is in the holy place. The Ark of the Covenant is in the Holy of Holies. So he would put that, 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 that incense upon that altar of incense in the holy place and get it nice and cloudy up in there. And then go, then open up that, or I think, did he open up the, uh, the veil? Some type of way he would go in there within the veil and it would be smoky in there too. I think the altar of incense was somewhere in that area. But the cloud would cover Yahweh's face. So the, the priest would not be able to look right up on Yahweh's face. But if you're looking at this, a little while back again, we saw that someone was going to appear before Yahweh alive. You can see how that's matching up now, that this priest did not look at Yahweh face to face, like Moses couldn't look at him face to face. He just saw the back part. But Yahweh would appear upon that between the two and the cherubim. All right? I heard somebody the other day, a Hebrew Israelite, saying that it was Yahweh that sat between the chair. All right. Maybe I would start tearing on the crack of the lap. But uh, Yahweh doesn't sit between the chairs. Okay. It's Yahweh that sits between the chairs. Okay. All right. Because it's Yahweh. That's the one that you can't look at without dying. And he was he would show up above the in the chair. I mean within the Ark of the Covenant. All right, between the two chairs. All right. So he shall put the incense upon the fire before you howl that the, of the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he died not. And he shall take the blood of the bullock and sprinkle his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. For the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his fingers seven times. And he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and for the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So he sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. All right. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of, you know, this atonement is for the holy place. Should make an atonement for the holy place but, but because of the uncleanliness of the children of Israel, and because of their transgressions and all their sins. So shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanliness. And there should be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have an atonement for himself and have made atonement for himself and for his household and for the congregation of Israel. And he shall go out unto the altar and before Yahweh and make an atonement for it. All right, so we get the picture. The major point into this is that we live in the latter day. So we know that he's going to go through with this whole thing. Now, now let's read a little further then. There's more stuff in here. He should go out into the altar just before Yahweh and make an atonement for, the, uh, for it and, make the, and take the blood of the bullock and bring the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. So he went outside of the holy and the holy place, the holy of holies and the holy place, where the altar is at, and put the blood on the on the horns, the four corners of the altar. To sprinkle the blood upon, upon it with his fingers seven times and cleanse, the, and it, cleanse it and hollow it from uncleanliness of the children of Israel. When he had made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation of the, in the altar, he should bring the live goat. All right, because there's some more stuff about the live goat. Remember, this live goat is appeared before Yahweh alive. Now, both goats appear before Yahweh, but one of them dies. But one of them does not die, it lives. It's a live goat. All right, so let me read that again. So, after he made an end of reconciling the holy place, the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, you should bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both hands upon the head 
I'm sorry, I didn't do any teaching at the moment. I should have had you all. And Aaron shall lay both hands upon the head of the live goat and cut and pass over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the live goat, shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. So he's gonna lay he's gonna lay his hands upon the live goat and put upon him all the iniquities and transgressions. Notice this, it didn't notice it didn't say sins. I want you to look at some stuff that's obviously that Yah did. It, Point out some things that over the years after reading this, you can see some look right here. Lay hand, both hands upon the head of the live goat, which is the appear before Yahweh alive, and confess over him all the iniquities. You notice it didn't say sins. And there's a different word for sin and iniquity. Iniquities and sin is not exactly the same thing. And confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions. And then it says, and all their sins putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. All right? Sin and iniquity is not the same thing, but the first thing that right there is dealing with is iniquity. Now, he did already offer the goat, the goat for the sin on All right? Let's see. All right? For the sin on He already offered the goat. And the goat shall bear upon him all the iniquities. Check this out. What is he bearing upon him? All the iniquities into a land not inhabited. Let me highlight this. Let me highlight this because this is important. So we want to really find out what this day of atonement is all about. We already know it has something to do with Yahweh Shai dying on, on the bee and Passover. And also fulfilling part of this, this, this day of atonement. So he fulfills part of it. He doesn't fulfill, he doesn't provide the atonement. That's not what the scripture says. We're going by what the Bible says, not what I want it to be, or think it is. It's what the scripture says. He doesn't, he doesn't provide the atonement. But he does, he does fulfill part of this feast, part of this Sabbath, excuse me, not a feast because you don't eat anything on it. He does fulfill part of this, this holy day, this day of atonement. So let me read that again. And the goat shall bear upon him all the iniquities unto a land not inhabited. And he shall let him go, let go the goat in, in the wilderness. So what iniquities is this he's bearing? Obviously, it's bearing upon him the, the iniquities of the children of Israel, right? Let's go to the previous verse. And Aaron shall lay both hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel, the 12 tribes. You notice he didn't confess over him all the iniquities of the whole world. Notice that. But the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, shall send them away by the hand of a fit man and into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear, their, they bear upon him. What is he bearing upon him? All their iniquities. Unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let the goat go, go, go in the wilderness. Let go to go in the wilderness. All right. Now, what do I think this is? It's probably your question. Give me your idea what this is all about. At this time, this is before the kingdom of David and Solomon, which happened around 1000 BC. 1000 BC, David and them were reigning over there. Solomon was reigning. Israel was at the top of their game, if you will. You know, if you can say that. They was reigning. They was had they had dominion over there. Not for long, but for that time they did. At this time, it's around 1400 BC, coming out of Egypt. So it's about 400 years before the reigning of David and Solomon. 1400 BC. Okay. Now we see that the children of Israel, the 10 Northern tribes, got expelled from the land for sinning against Yahweh in 722 BC. The 10 Northern tribes were kicked out by the Assyrians and went into captivity to the Assyrians. They left the Assyrians around 17, well, let me put it this way. They left the Assyrians eventually 
and they they went into a land not inhabited. The scripture says, and that's just the key to that. They went into a land not inhabited. And they call it uh, they call it uh, what do they call it? The country. I, I'm a, I'm gonna grab it in a second to show it to you. Let me get my clues over here. So it's a land not inhabited. All right. What I think this is talking about is talking about when they when the ten tribes, and it's not only talking about he dying and doing this for the ten tribes, but it's talking about he did this for all twelve tribes. He's going to do it for all twelve tribes. But this this goat scapegoat as a person that is represented because we know that the one goat represents Yahweh Shai, the, the goat that was for sin, that was offered for sin. That's Yahweh Shai gave his life. This goat that appears for Yahweh face to face, right there, he doesn't die. All right. He appears before Yahweh. I'm gonna highlight this real quick. And this is talking about the latter day stuff. We're talking about talking about that, but it hasn't happened yet. What is going to happen? Hebrew fifteen oh nine is the word not inhabited. Let's check it out. And see what it says in East Ward. A desert that's separated, not inhabited. The word is gazira. 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 I think I got that one right. Gazira. Sometimes just only look at how they say to say it. That seems to be harder sometimes than the, than the real word. Is there, all right? Not in heaven shall let the goat go into the wilderness. All right. Let me show you something real quick. I want to go back to one of my favorite books in the Bible. That's that's basically that the Catholic Church deemed as heretical or not good enough to be in the sixty six book canon. All right. Go to Second Ezra chapter thirteen. After seven days, I had a dream during the night. I looked and saw a wind rising from the sea and stirring up all the waves. As I watched, this wind made something like the figure of a man come out of the heart of the sea. Let me see that A right there because it's something they got some profound things in there. The Latin, the Latin omits this wind come up out of the heart of the sea. Okay. So we'll take that into consideration. I looked and saw the wind rising from the sea and stirring up all the waves. As I watched this wind made something like a figure of a man come up out of the heart of the sea. That man was flying among the clouds of heaven. Wherever he turned his face to look, everything that fell on his gaze trembled. Wherever an utterance came from his mouth, all who heard his voice melted as wax as the wax melts when it fills the fire. So right at the top, you should be thinking, what in the heck is this? Like, that's how I saw when I saw this, I was like, is this Yahweh Shai? But check this out. This man is coming up out of the heart of the sea. Now, if you're really good, like a like a like a, a lawyer, a good lawyer, you could say, well, the firmament up there, he's coming up out of the firmament. The firmament is the sea. You know, lawyers, <laughs> a good lawyer boy can make the uh, something that's fake and false look true. And the whole, had the whole, uh, what is it called? The people that are sitting there uh, that's going to make the judgment. Uh, the the group of people, the nine folks, where I have it, many people out there, make them really be deceived about the truth. A good lawyer can really do that. And if I was a good lawyer, I would say, the permanent is the sea. That's you know, like blue. It's just blue as the sea. The water's up there, up there, is down here. So he's coming out of the permanent. It didn't say that. He meant a wind rising. I looked and saw a wind rising from the sea. That's not the sea up there. That's the permanent. Stirring up all the waves. How can we see the waves being stirred up in the permanent, up in the heaven? That's what a defensive lawyer would come out with. How can you see this, the waves in the permanent? Being moved. No one can see that, right? As I watched this wind made something look like a figure of a man come up out of the heart of the sea. That man was flying among the clouds of heaven. Whenever he turned his face to look, everything that fell upon his gaze trembled. Wherever an utterance from his mouth, 
Whenever when that utterance came from his mouth, all who heard it bought it like Max when it melted, like wax melts when it fills the fire. All right. Who do you think this is? I'm gonna be honest with you. I think this is has some has something to do with the goat. That's the scapegoat. Whoever that scapegoat is, this is he right here. Is it Yahweh Shai? No. I've heard Hebrew Israelites say this is Yahweh Shai. No, this is not him. All right. So whoever the scapegoat is, this is him. And it's not Yahweh Shai because he's coming out of the sea. And the, the example of the coming out of the sea is, is Daniel chapter 7, when you have four beasts coming out of the sea that will rule over the earth in the latter days for, for thousands of years until the, their, their reign is over with. The last one we had, we didn't see the first one, was Babylon, all right, represented by a lion with wings. The second one was uh, Media Persia, represented by the bear with ribs in his mouth and one side higher than the other. The third was uh, a, a, a leopard with four four with wings on his back and four heads. I think it was which represents Greece, Alexander the Great in Greece. And the fourth beast would look like a, a dragon. All right, seven heads and ten horns, and it, it has a little horn coming out of it in the latter days. But this one is coming out of the same. It's coming out of the sea also. Notice that. All right, so this has something to do with somebody coming to get dominion. Some people say, no, that's your house. He's coming to get dominion. Check this out. Another lawyer <laughs> defense on that. The Yahweh said unto my Adon, sit at my right hand and stumble at Adon. And this is David's song. David was talking about his Adon was Yahweh. And Yahweh told Yahweh, sit on my right hand and tie me down in his footstool. Now, how will Yahweh make Yahweh his enemy? His footstool. All right. Yahweh's gonna make Yahweh Shai the one that died on the cross two thousand years ago, that did a lot of miracles, walked on water, rose from the dead. He's gonna make his enemies his footstool. Who's gonna do that for you for Yahweh Shai? Yahweh. He told him to sit on my right hand to make your enemies your footstool. Get it? Okay, let's go on. So this has to be something that has to do with Yahweh making Yahweh Shai's enemies his footstool. All right. I kept watching these things, and an innumerable multitude of people came together from the four winds of heaven to fight against the man who had come up out of the come up from the sea. So it would it would seem logical that if the fourth beast is still ruling over the earth, which looks like a dragon, seven heads and ten horns, and we see in Revelation chapter twelve, tw seven crowns upon his heads, and it's a red dragon. That they would come out to fight against this dude, whatever he's doing. Is this man really flying him on the sky and this clouds and everything? I think it is. I think this is not this is not exaggerated. All right. So let's let's see, verse five. I kept watching these things, and a notable multitude of people came together from the four winds of heaven to fight against the man who came up from the sea. I watched as he carved a great mountain for himself and flew into it. Ah. This is this is important right here. He carved what did he do? Carved a great mountain for himself. All right. Let's see, hold on just a moment. This kind of reminds you of Daniel chapter two, where the image that had the had the, the same sister situation going on. Hold on. The image that that was a great image that stood there, whose head represented Babylon, the head of gold, the chest of silver represented uh media Persia, the the, the loins represented Greece and the, the legs area represented Rome. Same type of stuff right here that, that Daniel chapter 7 was talking about, except they're beasts, Daniel chapter 7. All right? And you see at the end of this, this great image that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about, and he's going to kill his, uh, his, uh, his uh, what is it called? His magicians and astrologers. He's going to kill them because they could not tell him the dream nor what it meant. Oh, I see what y'all doing. Y'all can if y'all was so great of the magicians and astrologers and wise men, you could tell me what I dreamed as well as what it means. And Daniel basically went in and prayed because he was a part of that crew. Prayed that because he was he was gonna kill Daniel and the three Hebrew boys too. So they were a part of that. And Yah gave Daniel the, the dream, what the Nebuchadnezzar dream, and the interpretation of it. And Yah allowed that to happen so that this could get put down in the Word and we can see it today like we're seeing it. 
but the statue Daniel said in his his uh, his uh his understanding of the of the dream what Yah gave him. All right, the truth of the dream was that those 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 that image represented those same beasts that would reign all the way into the end of the world. All right, and we see the toes, the ten toes represented. It was basically part of part of iron, part of miry clay, and it represented the ten nations that would be ruling in the latter days. And they were it was partly strong, partly broken, but there was a he saw and beheld into a stone cut out without hands. A stone cut out without hands was flung at the feet of that image and broke it to shivers. All right. And the image became like chaff for the summer threshing floor. And like the wind drove it the chaff away, it drew it, drove it away. And the stone became a great mountain which filled the whole earth. All right. I think this has something to do with that. All right. Right here is saying that. Who carved the stone that was cut out without, and check this out, the stone was cut out without hands, but it says, I watched as he carved a great mountain for himself and flew into it. Right here, Daniel said the stone was cut out without hands. Right here is saying that he watched and this great, this man that came out of the sea carved a, a great mountain. All right? And flew into it. I tried to see the region, a place where the mountain was carved, but couldn't. Let me get this out of here real quick. So this mountain that even Edris tried to see where that mountain was from, turns out to be in the end, we'll, I won't say it. I'll just let it come to us. All right, so this mountain cut out with our hands come from the sky and hit the image on the feet. All right, but he says right here, I watched as he carved a great mountain for himself and flew onto it. He flew onto this mountain, all right? I tried to see the region, the place from which the mountain was carved, but I couldn't. Verse eight, after this, I looked and I saw that all who had gathered to do battle against him were sorely afraid, yet they dared to fight. All right. Now, I'm, I'm going to say it again. This is not Yahweh. This is not the Savior that died on the cross. And I got good reason to believe that it's not. He comes out, he comes out of the sea. What does the Savior Yahweh would come from? He would come from the clouds of heaven. He didn't say he would come out of the sea. When the, when the chief priest and them asked him, are you the Messiah? He said, yeah, I am. And hereafter, should you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the Father, sit on my right hand till I make thy name as I first do, Psalm 110, and coming in the clouds of heaven, Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. It didn't say nothing about no sea. Sitting on the right hand, coming in the clouds of heaven. All right? This man coming out of the sea, and he's flying among the, the clouds. All right? A little difference there. He looks like Yahweh. He looks like Yahweh. But remember, Yahweh is the express image of the Father. Yahweh is looking like the Father. All right. After this look, after this I looked, and I, I kind of gave some of what I'm talking about away. After this I looked and saw that all who had gathered together to battle against them were sorely afraid, yet dared to fight. So what's this right here? This is what. Joel is talking about where well, Yahweh is going to provoke the nations to come and fight with him. Not Yahweh shot. Yahweh. In the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, after the, the, the seven beasts are introduced, he's called the Ancient of Days, whoever this person is right here. The Ancient of Days is going to take out the nations, their, their power, their pomp. The Ancient of Days is going to do it. So I told you who he is, who I think he is. The ancient days. After this, let me read it again. After this, look, I look, I look, and I look that all those who are gathered to battle against him were sorely afraid, yet they dared to fight. So they were afraid of him already. Why are they afraid with him? Because we just read verse those that 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 original up there it says that he come up out of the sea. He was flying among the clouds of heaven. Everywhere he looked, everything trembled that fell up under his gaze. That means he would look at somebody. And look at things and they would tremble. Is that Yahweh? No. Yahweh was the Lamb of God. Could you say he would be the lion? He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Yeah. But this man is looking at stuff and stuff is trembling. And wherever the utterance came out of his mouth, all who heard his voice melted as wax melts. Melts when it fills the fire. 
know that the we stand in the court of law. This has got to be the ancient of days. And, and let me see. When I saw when he when he saw the rush of the multitude coming, he didn't raise his hand or hold a spear or any weapon of war. Rather, I saw something like a wave of fire. A wave of fire shoot forth from his mouth, and a breath of flame and his lips, and a storm of sparks from his tongue. All these things, all these things, a wave of fire, the flame and breath, the breath of flame, the mighty storm mixed together and fell upon the crowd that was rushing forward, prepared to fight. It burned all them all up. So that suddenly there was not that was that was seen of the innumerable multitude mob except the dust, except the dust of ashes and the smell of smoke. Let me read that again. I fell upon the it was mixed together, all of this flaming breath, storm, and all of that mixed together, and fell upon the crowd that was rushing forward, prepared to fight. It burned them all up so, so that nothing, suddenly nothing was seen of the innumerable mob, except the dust of ashes, smell of smoke. I saw this and was amazed. So right here is saying that this man just breathed on them and let something come out of his mouth. After he was caught up in the, to the to the to the to the to that to that stone he carved in heaven, he flew up there. And I watched as he carved a great mountain for himself and flew up, flew up to it. After these things, I saw the man coming down from the mountain and called to himself another crowd, a peaceful multitude. It says another crowd. The word key word there is another crowd. So was he working with a crowd before he went and flew up there? <clears throat> it wouldn't have said another crowd if he wasn't. Now this has something to do with that when he said that he's going to he's going to redeem the house of Judah, the the, the kingdom of Judah first. So who, what crowd was he working with before he went up there to the to Mount Zion? To Mount Zion, what crowd was he working with? The house of Judah, the kingdom of Judah. He was already delivering them. The scripture says he would deliver the house of Judah first. All right. So it's the kingdom of Judah. So what kingdom would that be? The kingdom of Judah would be the people that came over as slaves in the, in the latter days to the Western Hemisphere. They were bought over as slaves. They was, you know, you had three of those tribes at least. You have the uh, house of you had Judah, the tribe of Judah, Benjamin and Levi. And then you, when they bought them over here, they were all the same color. You notice they didn't bring any. People that was pale skin and blue eyes and straight hair over here, slaves. They all had woolly hair, dark skin, and eyes like a flame of fire. All right. They all looked alike. <clears throat> they were bought over to America and made slaves for hundreds of years. Not only to America, to the Americas, but to other lands. Great Britain was one of those lands over there they, they bought the slaves to. And they <clears throat> they uh they kind of shied out of the slave trade after Oleana Aquiano wrote his book about who he think he was. He proved to them that he was from the Israelites, writing the book. All right. And then when, when the Great Britain saw that, they basically said, uh, let's get out of the slave trade business quickly. All right. America kept the slave trade thing going on all the way into 1870 or 1864. All right. After these things, I saw the man coming down from the mountain. And we already, I just already hit, hit you onto it, the mountain is Mount Zion. All right. Come down from the mountain and call unto himself another crowd, a peaceful multitude. So what is this another, another crowd that he called to him other than Judah? It ten northern tribes. All right. A peaceful one. Many people came to him. Some were rejoicing and some were sad. Some were tied up and while the others were bringing other people as an offer. So who is this man? This is the ancient of days. This is the father. All right. Will you at this time restore the day? Actually, how Will you at this time restore the kingdom, Israel? And how I said, it's not for you to know the times of the seasons. The father was in his own power. So who's going to be the one that restored the children of Israel, the kingdom of Israel? The father. In other words, the ancient of days will do it. How do I know that? Because in Daniel chapter 7, it says that the little horn will wage war against the saints and overcome them. This is in Daniel chapter 7, verse, what is it, 20, 19, 20, 21? That the little horn of that beast, the fourth beast, 
which has to be the, the Pope, the Roman Pontiff, and all of them, would wage war against the saints. How did they do it? Well, the Inquisition and slavery. Listen to what I said real good. The Inquisition and slavery. That's how the little horn waged war against the saints and prevailed against them. And guess what? Until the Ancient of Days came. Read that. It's right there in Daniel chapter 7. So the Ancient of Days is the one that puts an end to it. Is it put to an end right now? No. No. We're still under that little horn. All right. I woke and I woke up in great fear and pleaded with the most high and said, From the beginning, you show your servant these wonders, and you considered me worthy that you should that you should receive my prayer. Now show me also the interpretation of this dream. As I've turned over in my mind, I think how terrible it will be for those who are will be left in those days and how much worse for those who aren't those who aren't left will be full of sorrow that means people that are dead that die before this happened you know will be full of sorrow since they know they they now know that what lies in store for the last for the last days but they won't live to see them but how terrible it would be also for those who are left for the very reason for that very reason, they will see great dangers, and they and there will be many kinds of distress, as these dreams show. Yet it is better to encounter these things, even in current danger, than to come to then to pass from the world like a cloud and not see what happens at the end. So what he's saying, right? He sees from the vision what he saw because he saw it literally with his eyes. He saw that it was it was a terrible. It was going to be terrible for those that would die. That means talking about the Israelites, because many will die when they see these things. Because how was I say many men's hearts filling up with fear, looking after those things that are coming up on the earth? They're gonna die just from terror, ain't danger. And that what they feel and what they see with their eyes. But there's gonna be many that does not die. But he said it's better for it's better to survive to the end in that day, not to pass away as a cloud, right? And not see what happens at the end. In other words, there's going to be something else, y'all. Many people are seeing these things going on right now. All over the world, America's not seeing the floods, the tornadoes, the earthquakes, and all of that stuff that's going on all in all, of the, uh, all the other nations right now. And then in the, the TV, uh, what is it? The news on TV is not showing these things. But you can see something that's going on and something coming, coming this way, too. Because all of the stuff that's going on around the world is happening in all the other nations except America. You know what I'm saying? It's like it's as if somebody's hand is doing this on purpose. And I think it is. But I don't think Yahweh is allowing man to do it on purpose. Yahweh is doing it on purpose. All right? Why isn't this stuff that's going on over all these other nations, China, Europe, and all these other lands, and I, and I think Africa is kind of guarded too. Why is it going on in all these lands where these where these these Hebrew Israelites are not at? Why is this judgment going on all, on all these other lands? I just answered your question because the Hebrew Israelites are not there, and these people have basically afflicted his people. But in America, it's not this dangers and these things are not going on here. Because they're still here. He's he's protecting his people. But shows you that he's coming for them too. All right. He's coming for these people. All right. Where am I at? Uh those who are okay. He's talking about those, it's gonna be great danger. Those who aren't left will be full of sorrow. So that means in the spirit realm, the fact that they didn't make it to the end, they be, they're going to be full of sorrow. So basically, it's kind of like a run, a race. Everybody that gets tired and stops, dies. Everybody that continues to run all the way to the end will be saved, will get the kingdom. They will not die. Okay? Uh, let me go on. He answered me, I will tell you the interpretation of the dream as well. And I will explain to you the things you spoke about. As to what you said about those who are left, this is the interpretation. 
He who brings he who brings the danger at that time will himself guard those who fall into danger. But who brings the danger? Yahweh. But he will guard those who fall into danger. Now, I don't know about you, just reading that right there, let me read it again. He who brings the danger at that time will himself guard those who fall into danger. That sounds like that person that's guarding those that fall into danger, that's bringing the danger, is that man that came up out of the sea. So if that man that comes out, comes out of the sea is, is causing the danger and guarding those that fall into danger, who does that sound like? I just said it a little bit ago. It sounds like Yahweh. All right? He who have works and faith in, in the most mighty one. Let me read it again. He who brings the danger at that time will himself guard those who fall into danger. And these ones that fall into danger that he guards, they have works and faith in the most mighty one. In other words, in El Elyon, the most high. Know therefore that those who are left enjoy greater privilege than those who have died. The interpretation of the visions are these. This is why you need to know the Bible. You need to be very serious about this because there's coming a time where you're going to really have to know your Yahweh. The Bible says they that know their God should be should be strong and do exploits. All right? In the book of Daniel. And that you saw a man coming up from the heart of the sea. This is the one whom the Most High has been keeping for many ages. All right? For many ages. All right? I'm going to show you that that can't be Yahweh Shai because how many ages has Yahweh Shai been kept? If you look at an age as a thousand years, you would you don't say many ages for a couple. He's been he's been kept for a couple ages, not many ages. Many ages start to go to four, five, six, but a couple ages is how you would say that if it was Yahweh. But in that you saw the man coming up from the heart of the sea. This is the one that when the Most High has been keeping for many ages. He will liberate God's creation all by himself and by and he will put in order those who are left. And that you saw something like wind and fire and, and storm come out of his mouth, that he didn't hold a spear or weapon of war, yet destroyed the rest of the multitude that come to fight him. Here's the interpretation. Now that Joel, the book of Joel, chapter three, where it says that in that day when I shall be, when I shall, when I shall redeem and bring out the house of Judah and Jerusalem, when I shall restore the house of Judah and Jerusalem, I think Joel chapter three says, I will bring, I will gather all nations to the to the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them for my people whom they scattered among the nations and parted my land. I think that's how it goes. Let me, I'm gonna take you there real quick and we're gonna go back to this. So who is that that's gathering all nations to the valley of Jehoshaphat? The valley of Jehoshaphat is right over there in the middle, going through a certain part of the temple mount. Valley Jehazabad is over there near the, the the creek. I forgot the, the name of that creek, that water. Uh, Kidron Valley, you can see. Yeah, that's it, Kidron Valley. I'll just go to Joel. So it's written right here. And this person is gonna be judging the nations for what they've done to his people. Let's guess who? It's Yahweh. Because <laughs> remember, Yahweh is not God. All right? Good master, what, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? What did Yahweh Shai say? Why calls thou me good? There's none good but God. Hmm? Joe, Daniel, what is it? John chapter 17. This is eternal life that they may know thee, the only true God, and in Jesus Christ whom thou sent. So he, Jesus is not saying he's the only true God. He's praying to the only true God. And this is eternal life that they may know thee, the only true God. And the only true God sent Jesus Christ or sent Yahweh Shire Mashiach, all right, to, to die for the sins of Israel. He created him first, in Genesis chapter one, verse one, he created Yahweh Shire. And then basically used him to make everything else, the heavens and the earth. And then sent him down to die for the sins of his people 2,000 years ago. That's the Lamb of God. But is this the Lamb of God that's doing this right here? For behold, in those days and at that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, 
I will also gather all nations and will bring them down to the valley of Jasper and plead with them there for my people, for my heritage Israel, whom they are scattered among the nations and parted my land. They have cast lots for my people, given a boy for a harlot, sold a girl for wine that they might drink. Yea, what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon, and all the coast of Palestine? Will you render me a recompense? And if you recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? Because you have taken my silver and gold, carried into your temples my goodly pleasant thing. Rome. Okay, verse six. Hold on just a moment. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have you sold unto the Grecians, that you may remove them far from their border. So this is the one that he's got his eyes on right now, children of Judah and children of Jerusalem. Now remember, Jerusalem had members of all 12, 12 tribes in it. So there's a certain amount of every 12, of all the 12 tribes in Jerusalem. That sounds like 144,000 in the latter days. But that Jerusalem that he's talking about is members of the 12 tribes. All that they had to do lots and who would live in Jerusalem when it was all over with, and they chose a certain amount of each tribe to live in Jerusalem. Behold, I will raise them out of the place where you have sold them and will return your recompense upon your own head. So really, to be honest with you, along with the house of Judah and the house of uh, the three tribes, the southern tribes, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, that could be members of all 12 tribes with them in captivity and slavery. And obviously, they would not be looking any too much different than those three tribes where they looked in sleep. All right. As a matter of fact, I watched on YouTube a, a documentary about Michael Jackson's family tree. And he, they were showing how on his father's side, it goes all the way back to some Indian folks. All right. But the Indian, the Indian folks, it goes to, then it goes to the white slave master that had an Indian concubine, but they were slaves. These Indian people were slaves, but he made a, he, the slave master had a concubine that was an Indian woman. She produced an Indian looking man. He's very tall. And this man is where Michael and, and his father and all of them come from on the father's side. All right. And they eventually married into Negro looking people, but these Indians look Negro too. But let me go on. The children also of Judah and children of Jerusalem have you sold into the Grecians. That you might remove them far from their border, or how I raise them out of the place whether you have sold them and will return your recompense upon your own head. And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hands of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabians, to a people far off, for Yahweh has spoken it. Proclaim, watch this, proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up, you mighty, wake up the mighty men. Let the men of war draw near and let, let them come up. I'm laughing because they in some trouble. <laughs> oh my goodness. They don't know what they're messing with. <laughs> All right. This is not Jesus. This is not Yahweh they're messing with. All right. That's what I'm talking about. That, that ancient of days is the creator. You hear what I'm saying? That ancient of days is the creator. They don't know what they're messing with. Okay. As a matter of fact, they when we're just looking at the the Esdras, it did say they 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 was fearful there, yet they dared to fight. So they had a guy, they had a clue. Okay, but let me continue to read. I'm gonna go back to that. All right. <laughs> Prepare ye this among the Gentiles, a fair war. Wake up the mighty men and let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. So they come up with all their technologies of war to fight against him. All right. What do we see in that? It said they came to fight and wage war against the man that came out of the sea and it was flying among the clouds. A great multitude and an, an, an innumerable multitude. What did it say he took them to? Right here, we see it in Joel chapter 3. He's taking them to the valley of Jehoshaphat to judge with them and plead with them there because of his people. And remember, when he basically destroyed them, he gathered another multitude. So he had already been working with the house of Judah in the, in the, in the city of Jerusalem, the people of Jerusalem. He redeemed them first. He bought them out first. Obviously, they saw this and they wanted to fight with him. You can put two and two together. So when you read the scriptures, it's precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. You have to, it's not going to tell you the whole story in one place. It's going to be a little bit here and a little bit in the next book, a little bit over here. You have to you have to rightly divide the way the truth. That's what the word says. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly 
if I ignore the truth. That's even why I get all my truth from the Bible. I don't watch movies. Now, some movies like The Matrix and all that kind of hint to you what the Bible's talking about. As a matter of fact, the woman that wrote The Matrix was a Christian, was a believer in the Bible. She wrote The Terminator also and had to get royalties for all of that because the people stole those ideas from her. But I don't get my whole Bible from The Matrix and The Terminator. I, you know what I'm saying? I don't worship and, and get the word of God from, the, from those movies. You get your word from the Bible. All right. All right. So he said, prepare, prepare you. This is funny. Pray you this among the Gentiles. Prepare war and wake up the mighty men and let all the men of war draw near and let them come up. So they get ready to fight against the Creator. In other words, beat, ye, beat your piles, shares, and the swords and the pruning hood and the spirit. Let the weak say, I am strong. So this is not Yahweh Shai, this is Yahweh. Assemble yourselves, come up, you heathen, and gather yourselves together and call them heathen. So he's making them mad. You know, you know how Muhammad Ali used to make people mad when he's fighting them so that they could go out that band in the game plan and get themselves the rocks. He did that with George Foreman too. He got George Foreman all out of his game plan. And then that six or seven days round, he rocked George Foreman big time. You know, right? not, not, not too many people thought Muhammad Ali was going to win that fight. As a matter of fact, he was not stronger than George. He was nothing. He was no match for George physically. But mentally, up here he was, all right, and got him. All right? Assemble yourselves and come, all you heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. They're the cause of the mighty ones to come down on Yahweh. All right? Look at that. So this is Yahweh that they're going to be fighting with, that is, that is, that is taunting them. They come and fight with him. So that's the reason why you see that innumerable multitude come to fight. Because Yahweh's taunting them. Hold on just a moment. Some people say Yahweh wouldn't do that. Oh, yes, yeah, see, that's what he's doing right here. Some of yourselves come, all you heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Did the cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Yahweh? Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge. Who will sit to judge? Yahweh. But there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Yahweh's going to sit and judge. He's not going to be somewhere in the heavens sitting. He's going to be on the earth sitting. Okay? Put ye in the sickle for the, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get ye down, for the press is full, the fast overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of Yahweh. And what day is this? The day of Yahweh. Is it called the day of Christ? No, it's called the day of Yahweh. Now, there, there is in the New Testament the day of Christ. But this right here is the day of Yahweh. All right? And Peter spoke about it that's going to be revealed by fire. And God basically judged the world one time by water in the times of Noah. But this judgment, this day of Yahweh is with fire. For the day of Yahweh is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, the stars shall draw their shining. For Yahweh also, the Yahweh shall roar out of Zion, shall also roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. What did it say? We were just reading in the book of Ezra. And when the people heard his voice, they, they, they basically wilted like as if the fire, when, it, <clears throat> when the fire melts wax at the beginning of the second Ezra chapter 13. He's going gonna to utter his voice. So that's when I say that this is Yahweh. This is the ancient of days that's coming, not Yahweh Shai. Yahweh Shai doesn't come until the, until the ancient of days puts all of these kingdoms down. After he judges this, Jeh Jeh this valley of Jehoshaphat situation. Then when he's sitting down on his throne after he's done this, then we see the son of man, the one likened to the son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. And they brought him near before the ancient of days. Then Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. That's when he comes after Yahweh does this. Because what did it say? Yahweh said unto my Adon, sit on my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So who's going to make Yahweh's enemies your footstool? Yahweh, the ancient of days. He's going to do it big time. All right. <laughs> That's why I say I don't see how people don't, don't read this and see this. Yahweh also shall roar out of Zion, out of his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. And we saw that in the scriptures it said yet once more he shakes not only the earth, he's gonna shake the heavens and the earth. See that? Who's gonna shake the heavens and the earth? Yahweh. 
Yahweh shall roll out of Zion out of his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But Yahweh will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Let's go, let's go a little further. For you that have to find it hard to believe that Yahweh is coming down here, the one that Moses cannot look at, so shall you know that I am Yahweh, Yahweh I am. What is he doing? Dwelling in Zion, my holy mount. Then shall Jerusalem be holy. There shall be no strangers, there shall no strangers pass through her anymore. All right, see that? Let me highlight this very quick. So we're reading this second edge. Let me go back there. I just wanted to take you here real quick and show you an example of what's really going on. Right there in second edge chapter 13. Hold on just a moment. So should you know that I am Yahweh, Yahweh I am, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. So what did the man form when the people were coming at them? He formed the mountain in the air with his hand. And let's go back there real quick. What did he form? He formed Zion. All right, let's go there. Verse 8, and after this, I looked and saw that all who had gathered to do battle with him were sore, sorely afraid, yet they dared to fight. When he, when he saw the rush of the multitude coming, he, did. he didn't raise his hand or hold spear, but I think I'm a little ahead of myself. It's going to be verse 7 or verse 6 or 7. I kept watching these things, and the new of a multitude of people came together from the four winds of heaven to fight against the man who came up out of the sea. I watched as he carved a great mountain for, for himself and flew unto it. So what mountain was that? Mount Zion. Now, the reason why we're talking about this whole thing, because we started in, in Leviticus about the, the, the scapegoat. The scapegoat and the, the, the what is it? The scapegoat and the, the goat that was for sin offering, the sin offering goat, they both would appear before Yahweh. But remember, the scapegoat is the one that, causes the atonement. And we got the atonement, the day of atonement coming up on us. The scapegoat is the one that causes the day of atonement. It causes the atonement. The, the sin offering doesn't do it. The scapegoat, and the scapegoat has to be coming in the latter days. That's when we're still on the earth and the kingdom hasn't come yet. All right? So he formed for himself, he, he said, I watched as he carved a great mountain for himself and flew unto it. Now this is Superman all over again. This is where they probably got Superman from. Up, up, and away, all right? I watched Superman as a kid, and that was really something else. I, I watched the, what's it, George Reeves. It shows you how old I am. George Reeves from the 50s. I wasn't even born in the 50s. But, you know, it still had the little uh, reruns of Superman from the 50s. And I'm going to tell you the truth. Uh, the, the old Superman, 50, the 50s, seem more charismatic to me than the new Superman movies, even though they're more high tech. That old Superman, to see the black and white, somebody that's not in good a shape as the new Superman flying in the air. Up, up and away, he takes off, right? He had that Roman, that Roman uh, cape on. That's what the Romans wore when they fought, when capes. You know, but they had military gear on too, but it shows you basically about Rome. But this looks like Superman, but it's not going to be Superman. It's going to be Israelite man. All right, <laughs> House of Judah man, Kingdom of Judah man is flying around. So he formed himself a great mountain and flew, flew up on it. So that mountain that he formed was Zion. So that's telling you that if he formed the mountain, who is he? He's Yahweh. All right, and that mountain. Let's let's go back to where we was just at. He formed the mountain and flew up on it. Right there, what's going on up there? The Day of Atonement ritual is going on on, on Mount Zion because on Mount Zion is where the original Day of Atonement ritual would go on. On Mount Zion is Jerusalem in the temple. What's going on up there that, on that mountain that he just formed? The same thing. So when he flies up on that mountain, guess what he is? He's this scapegoat that appears before Yahweh, right? 
I hope y'all see that. The scapegoat in Leviticus chapter 16 that appears before Yahweh, alive. He appears before Yahweh, alive. Okay? That's who that scapegoat is. He's the one that appears before Yahweh, alive. This is him right here. So who is he? He's the Ancient of Days. So Yahweh sent his son first. He was the lamb. And he comes in the latter days himself. himself. Like he said, Yahweh said, said, I go and I'm going unto the Father, but the Father is greater than I. Oh, you never see. You wasn't lying. All right? And we're going to, I think everybody's going to see that Yahweh said wasn't lying and the Father is greater than him. All right? So let's go back here. Let's see, I have a chat. There's 11 of them. Hold on just a moment, people. I want to answer this real quick. Well, it's not 11, it's my eyes going to kissing this one, one chat. Okay, hold on. Is this event the same as the thief in the night? They will sound like two separate events. This event is the well, the Bible says that the day of Yahweh comes as a thief in the night. Yeah. The, if you look at the scripture, it says the day of the Lord, but that, that Lord is really Yahweh. All right. Hold on just a moment. The Lord is really Yahweh. And right there in that scripture in the New Testament, I think it's in Second Peter. Paul speaks about it too. In Thessalonians, the day of Yahweh. All right. And also the day that he speaks, he doesn't call it the day of Yahweh. He says that day in First Corinthians chapter three. So it is the day of Yahweh that comes as a thief in the night. But he says, You're not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. So that's when I say stay with the word and find and just be able to browse through the word and just like what you see me doing. And I'm still not tip top condition on it. But it was one thing I do know. That this man right here that's flying around out of the sea and flying up in the clouds and forms a great mountain in the air is it, it turns out to be Mount Zion is Yahweh. All right. Yeah, the father, God and father of Yahweh Shahamashia. All right. Uh, let me see where we at. He answered me, I, I will tell you the interpretation of the dream as well and will explain to you things you spoke of. So he who brings the danger, verse 23. At that time will himself guard those who fall into danger. We have works with faith in the most mighty one. So the, who is this? This is the most mighty one. The guy that you see. <laughs> they had that guy, the Superman from this guy. The most mighty one. In other words, Superman that they made was really, they were trying to say that these people were, this man was Superman, that, you know, that Superman. That he was really God. Because they patterned Superman out. Also, they had that read, 2nd Ezra chapter 13, and padded their Superman off of this man right here. All right? This man right here ain't got no cape on, I, I guarantee you that. Might have some fringes on, but he ain't got no cape on. All right? But he brings the danger at that time with himself, guard those who fall into danger. And how was I said that in the latter days, many people's heart going to be feeling them for fear, looking after those things that are coming up on the earth. All right? Know, therefore, that those who are left enjoy greater privilege than those who have died. Their interpretation of the vision is as follows. And that you saw a man coming up from the heart of the sea, that is, one, that is the one that the Most High has been keeping for many ages. He will liberate God's creation. Check this out. He will liberate God's creation all by himself. Now, who is that? He will liberate God's creation all by himself, and he will put in order those who are left. Who is that? That's your how was your well, if Yahweh gave him the power to do it, but I don't think that's Yahweh shot. I think if the one that's going to liberate God's creation is going to do it, this God himself liberating his own creation. He just can't imagine that God would come down here as a human being. But look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. Great is the mystery of godliness. And I spoke about this last week. Great, great is the mystery of godliness. God manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, Preach unto the Gentiles, received up in the glory. Now, when you, many people that know that scripture is very good, it says God was manifest in the flesh. 
they was, that was is trying to say that Jesus was God. Jesus was not God. And when you press on that word was, it doesn't, it doesn't click. So the so whoever the Catholic Church or whoever did that put that was in there. But the way you read that scripture is God manifests in the flesh. That is a mystery of godliness. Great is the mystery of godliness. God manifests in the flesh. Justified in the spirit. And that means God won't be justified in the flesh. He's going to be justified in the spirit. Because God made Yahweh to be justified in the flesh. He made him to be, he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. But Yahweh was justified in the flesh. But this God that comes down in the latter days is justified in the spirit. Let me read it again. Great is the mystery of God in this. God manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, not in the flesh, seen of angels, preaching to the Gentiles, received of in the glory. All right. So he, God, is not even justified in the flesh. He sent his son to do that. That's the reason why he's called the Lamb of God. He made him to be sin for us so who knew no sin. So Yahweh did not know sin. He condemned sin in the flesh by the death of his son. He condemned sin in the flesh. All right? The death of his son condemned sin in the flesh. He basically overcomes sin. But that's not this God. He basically was justified in the spirit, just like the saints are. All right? And you saw something like fire coming out of his mouth, and that he did not hold spear or weapon of war, yet destroyed the rush of the multitude that came to fight with him. Here's the interpretation. Look, the days are coming when the Most High shall begin to rescue those who are on earth. So he's calling them the Most High. He's going to begin to rescue those who are on earth. Those who live on earth will go out of their minds. It's verse 30, let me read that again. Those who live on earth will go out of their minds. And that's what Yahweh Shai said. Men's hearts fell in them for fear, looking after those things coming up on the earth. They were playing to wage war against each other, city against city, place against place, nation against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Then these things will happen. And the signs that I showed that I showed you before will take place. Then my son will be revealed. Now, right here it's saying his son. Does that mean that that's Yahweh Shai? No. Because really, this man is in the place of God's son. He is God, but he's the son. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. When they when they say that God is a trinity, the reason why you think the, the Catholics say a trinity is because they're thinking that Jesus was God, the Father is God, the Son is God. Well, they're not too far off. Let me explain the reason why. Yahweh is not God. He was created. But there is something like what, a, what I would say is a trinity. I don't call it a trinity. There is something like that. Because this man is coming, will be Yahweh's son, but he's Yahweh at the same time. You hear what I'm saying? Because when Yahweh Shai comes out of the sky, comes out of the sky and he's coming with the clouds of heaven in Daniel chapter 7, which he told the chief priests, hereafter you see the son of man sitting on the right hand of the father and coming in the clouds of heaven. All right? When he comes in Daniel, it says he's one like the Son of Man. He didn't say he was the Son of Man. He says he's one like the Son of Man. So who's the real Son of Man in this situation? The Father is the one that's a real Son of Man. So the Father is going to come down and add him seed in the end. That's what Satan knew. And Satan knew this very well. Because he was a cherub. He's an anointed cherub that stood at the, at, the, at the throne of God. That covered. So he knew the plan. And when he tempted the woman to sin, he had his mind on that. And the thing was, he already knew what was going to happen. He's going to be damned. But he was willing for the for the little, what is it, a few thousand years of rulership over there to take his, to take his chances. He told the woman, "You should not surely die. But you should, but you should, but you, but your eyes and the day you eat there, your eyes should be open, knowing good and evil. What did he say? Your eyes should be open." You're going to know good and evil. You're going to be like God. Now, the, the New Testament, I mean, the way they wrote it in our Bible, it says you'd be like God's G-O-D-S, little G. But the, really, the way that it's really spoken is you should be as you should be as God. Not no S with an S at the end. They tried to basically try to do a little uh, interpretation of their own selves on that. But it says you should be as God, knowing good and evil. And God himself, after the fall, he said, Man has become as one of us to know good and evil. Not unless he put forth his hand and take all sort of the tree of life. 
So he kicked him out of the garden. So who's the one that's God that knows good and evil? It's this fellow right here. Because remember, he's not even he's not even justified in the flesh. He's justified in the spirit. Just like the saints are justified in the spirit. So Satan knew that God would come down in Adam's seed. Not that just the son of God, both of them would come down in Adam's seed. But Satan knew that God would come down too in Adam's seed. He's willing to take that chance. And he's going to try to fight and keep his rulership over the earth when this man, when God comes down. That's what this fighting is all about because Satan is trying to keep his rulership. And I'm going to tell you what Satan has done. You look in the book of 2nd Ezra, I mean, excuse me, 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2, where it says, that day shall not come and said that come a fallen away first, that man of sin be revealed, whom the Lord shall destroy with, his, with, with, the, with the spirit of his mouth and the brightness of his coming. All right? But what it tells you is this, is that Satan will hold the whole world in a state like it is right now. It's a lukewarm state. The reason why Satan is not trying to go off on the world and kill everybody, because what happens is when he does that and he tries to do something like that, Yah comes quicker and takes him out. So what does he want? What does Satan want? He wants peace. And the scripture says in the book of Daniel, by, for by peace shall he deceive many. He will destroy many just by peace. So Satan don't want conflict. He wants peace because when that day when that man is taken out of the way, that's coming, that's becoming, this, this son of man that is really Yahweh is taken out of the way. Then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall destroy with the spirit of his mouth and, the, with his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So only now he who lets will let until he be taken out of the way. Who's the one that's going to let until he's be taken out of the way? Yahweh. First of all, Yahweh, 2,000 years ago when Yahweh died on the cross and rose again, that angel of Yahweh descended from heaven and rolled the stone away. What did that angel do after he descended and rolled the stone away? He did not go back up into heaven. He gave that authority to Yahweh Shai, who just rose. Yahweh Shai said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. What was going on? When that Holy Spirit came, that comforter came and comforted the, the believers, that was Yahweh, that Holy Spirit, the angel of Yahweh. That was Yahweh that came down. In the end, after all of these thousands of years of Yahweh being with the saints, he's going to become. What does that mean? He's going to become a human being. That means he's going to be also born just like Yahweh was. Now remember, he's not doing just like Yahweh Shai. Yahweh Shai done just like him. The Son of God was like God when he came down on the earth 2,000 years ago, just that God had not come and done his work yet. So when Yahweh Shai was manifesting in the flesh, he was doing what the Father is going to do. The Father is going to be manifesting in the flesh, like we just said. God manifests in the flesh. It's great as the mystery of God. Not God was manifesting in the flesh. God had not been manifested in the flesh at the time of Yahweh Shai yet. So the Catholics put that was in there, make it look like Yahweh Shai was God. But the word that, that was is not there. You press on it, but get you a concordance and press on that word was. It's not in there. So it's really God, greatest mystery of God in this, God manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, and then say God was justified in the flesh even. Yahweh Shai was justified in the flesh. But God is justified in the spirit, just like the saints. And this God is justified in the spirit, knows good and evil. That's what Satan told the woman. You should not surely die, but you should be, your eyes should be open, and you should know good and evil, and you should be like God. You should be God, basically, is what he told Eve. In other words, God will come down in your seed. And we see this in Revelation chapter 12, where the woman, which represents Mount Zion, the sign in heaven, a pregnant woman who's, who's travailing to give birth, give birth to a man child who's caught up unto God. Check this out. He's caught up unto God into his throne. That means he did not caught up to sit on the right hand of God. He's caught up unto God and to his throne. That means he's going to be God. That man child that Revelation chapter 12 speaks about. All right. So let me go on. So the, so the, so he is the, he is a son also. So he's God, he's, he's Yahweh, but by him being manifest in the flesh, he is the son. So that God has two sons. It's kind of confusing a little bit, but 
Yahweh Shai was like him. All right? He's not like Yahweh Shai. Yahweh Shai is like him. Okay? Okay, let me see. Where we at? I was just reading it. The days are coming when the Most High will begin to rescue those who dwell on there. Those who are on there will go out of their minds, which is the people that's running the world today going to go out of their mind. But you can see that he's going to be doing things that they don't understand. For one thing, coming out of the sea and flying in the clouds, all right? Now, years ago, after I received Christ in my heart and I got changed, I didn't understand the change. And I'm going to tell you what I was seeing. I was seeing a man sometime in the clouds dressed in black. And I would see this, and I, I didn't tell nobody this, because I was thinking, am I losing my mind? I thought I was losing my mind. I was wondering about it until I got filled with the Holy Spirit. When I got filled with the Holy Spirit, he showed me himself. At that time, I got filled with the Holy Spirit. And he was the same guy that was in the clouds, and I see him in bushes. I see his silhouette and certain things. And I was wondering about it, and I started hearing voices, a voice trying to talk to me. And the type of clothes he was wearing is like those orthodox clothes that the Jews be wearing. <clears throat> but he was a black man. And he had his collar turned up, trying to be cool. He was turned up a little bit. All right? So I thought I'd tell you that. I was filled with the spirit and I saw him. And I saw, guess what? I saw Mount Zion. And I, I've said this before. They were playing to wage war against each other and city against city, place against place, nation against nation. Yeah, I wish I said that. There'd be wars, rumors of wars, kingdom against kingdom, ethnicity against na nation against nation. He said that. And kingdom against kingdom. When these things happen, the signs that I showed you, the, uh, when I showed you before take place, then my son will be revealed when, you, when we saw as a man rising up. All right. So basically, Yahweh in heaven is talking about Yahweh on earth that's rising up out of the sea. When all the nations hear his voice, and each one will leave his own region and will leave off the wars they have waging against each other, and a new group of mob will be gathered together, as you saw, wanting to come and fight with it, fight against him. That sounds like Esau, doesn't it? He has the anointed sword. So he's going to come in with his anointed sword and fight against his men but he will take his stand on, on the summit of Mount Zion. And this is when he's going to basically fulfill that scripture in Leviticus 16 about the, the, the Day of Atonement and being the scapegoat that appears before Yahweh. But he should take his stand on the summit of Mount Zion. Zion will come and will appear. Now, Zion is likened to a woman. We okay. see her in Revelation chapter 12, pregnant with a son. She bought forth a man child. Zion will come and will appear to, to all. Built and ready as you saw, a mountain carved without hands. And Daniel, in the book of Daniel says that she watched until a stone was cut out without hands but smote the image on the feet. My son himself will indict the assembled nations for their impious deeds. These things will, were indicated by the storm. Now, I'm going to show you how this scripture about Yahweh himself being the son too. The scripture says in Revelation chapter 21, he that overcometh will, will inherit all things. And I'll be his father, and he shall be my son. So who inherits all things? That means the stars, the throne of God up in heaven. Who inherits all things in heaven and in earth? Let me say that scripture again. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. I'll be his God, and he shall be my son. Who inherits all things? including the throne of God up in heaven. Notice it said all things. He didn't, he didn't say all things except my throne. All things. He inherits all things. That's, that's Yahweh himself in the form of a human, human being. He's inheriting all things. My son himself will indict the simple nations for their impious deeds. These things were indicted. These things were indicated by the storm. He will scold them for their evil plans and reveal the torments which, which they are about to be tortured. These things will come, come to correspond to the flame. He will destroy them. Now remember Peter said that the that the that the, the judgment, the coming of Yahweh is like a is going to be with fire. Let me read that again. He will scold them for their evil plans and reveal the torments with which they are about to be tortured. These things correspond to the flame. Drake, you up over there? There's that scripture where it's talking about the flame. 
he will destroy them without effort by the law, which is indicated by the fire. All right. And the fact that you saw him collecting to himself another peaceful multitude, and this is what a what a scapegoat going into the wilderness, all right, comes in comes into play at. Because remember, the ten tribes, right? It's gonna talk about the ten tribes. What did they go? They came to a place called Azarus. Let's read this real quick. And as to the fact that you saw him collecting to himself another peaceful multitude, these are the ten tribes which were taken captives from their lands in the days of Hosea, whom King Shalmaneser of the Assyrians took across the river as captives. They were taken to another land, but they made this plan for themselves. They will leave the multitude of the nations and go into a more remote region where the human race had never lived. Wilderness, yeah, where the human race had never lived. Nobody human had ever lived over there. There they would be able to observe their customs which they had never kept in their own region. They went into the narrow passages of the Euphrates River. Some people think this is Africa. All right, no, it wasn't Africa. Then when the Most High gave them signs and stopped the flow of the river until they had passed over, until they had passed. They made a long journey through, the, through that region for a year and a half, and that region is called Azus. It wouldn't take a year and a half to get down from Assyria down in Africa. That region, a year and a half, that region is called Azus. They lived there until the last time. Now they, now they begin to again to return. The Most High will once again stop the flow of the river so that they can cross. These people make up the multitude gathered in peace. So when it says that the that the the, the uh, scapegoat goes into the wilderness, it's talking about this right here. He fulfills that wilderness thing right here in this this part of the world. This is where he's going to be found at in this part of the world. The one that the ancient of days is going to be found in this part of the world. He's going into the wilderness to, co to collect up the ten northern tribes. And at that time, when this was, law was given, there was a, there was a wilderness. The world was a wilderness. All right. This is a more remote region. Took a long journey, about a year and a half. That region is called Azus. They lived there until the time, last time, and, and now they began to again to return. The Most High will once again stop the flow of the river so that they can cross. These people make up the multitude of the people, multitude gathered in peace, along with those who are left of your people who are found within my border boundaries. Then when they begin to destroy, then when he begins to destroy the multitude of the nations that are gathered, he will protect the people who have survived. Then he will show them again many more uh, sword, many more signs. He's gonna be doing a lot of signs. And I said, Supreme Lord, Supreme Yah, show me why I saw a man rising up from the heart of the sea. See, so even Ezra's found this hard to believe. But not because Yahweh Shai had not been revealed yet, because in this book, Yahweh Shai is revealed. But he's wondering who this man, what this man is coming out of the heart of the sea. He said to me, just as one, just as no one can seek out or know what is in the depth of the sea, so no one can on the earth can see my son or those who are with him except in a time when he when his days has come. And this is before Yahweh came on the earth. This is no one no one can seek out or know what is in the depth of the sea. So no one on earth can see my son or those that are with him except in the time when his day has come. So that means he's in the earth. No one can go and search out and find out where he, where he's at and who he is. Until that day comes. When that day comes, it's too late. It's like a thief in the night. So that's when you want to have yourself ready. You always want to be studying, reading the scriptures, and studying these things. Now it's good. I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I find myself always listening to teachings and all of that and reading. If I'm not doing that, I'm reading, studying for myself. All right? Study good and pray. When you, when you study your word, pray. Y'all will hear you trying to trying to get to know his word better. He won't deny that. He won't hate you for doing that. He won't despise your prayer. Now, if you pray and you, you see stuff in there you're supposed to be doing it, you just you harden your heart to it and you don't do it, you will stop answering your prayer. But the 
word says he that he that turned away his heart, turned away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer would be an abomination. So when you pray, start doing what the Bible says. Put your fringes on. Let me show you. Let me see if I can bring my fringes up here. Put your fringes on. I hope you can see that. Put your fringes on. All right. And obey all the commandments. All right. Put your fringes on. I sound like a song. All right. Girl, put your fringes on. Girl, okay. Let me stop. Right. I think Corinne and Boo will be upset with me before that. But anyway. But the 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 the, the what is it called? The scapegoat causes the atonement. So we have the day of atonement. Today is the eighth, the first month, the seventh month, the eighth day. Tomorrow is the ninth day, and that evening at Ered, before the sun goes down, you begin to flick your sword, and as you stop eating, until the tenth day at evening, then you can eat again. But how we do it in the in the lands of our captivity, we just don't eat. We afflict our souls, like the scripture said. But the the whole meaning of the day of day of atonement, the atonement that takes place. The one that causes the atonement is this ancient of days, this man right here in 2nd Ezra chapter 13, who is not really Yahawashah, but I can see why most people think he's Yahawashah, because he calls him his son. So what I'm seeing is that Yahweh himself is coming down. When he comes down, he's going to be manifest in the flesh. All right? While Yahweh is still in heaven, he's going to be on earth. He's going to be hidden because, what is it, Isaiah 49 says, if you hit me, you hide him. Yahweh hides the one that's really him until that day. That one that's really him becomes him. He doesn't just, he's not just really him from the very beginning. He becomes Yahweh. That's right. Because <laughs> Yahweh Shai was the son of God from birth. He knew who he was from the very beginning. But God, when Yah is manifest in the flesh, he doesn't know who he is. He's just like the saints, just like any other human being saint. That's the only way Satan wanted to pull that thing off because he wanted, he wanted to see if he could get God's throne. He was jealous of man. And he tried to get God's throne. Isaiah chapter 14. All right. And he was jealous, but Yah would come down. And, he, and Yah basically is like Yah put one hand behind his back and said, come on, fight. He's going to fight the nation with one arm behind his back. That's how I kind of feel. So I had my stroke. This hand right here is kind of a little bum. But Yah's going to put one hand behind his back and fight, get, fight sick and overcome him big time. Because Yah's coming down without knowing who he is. That means he will find out who he really is. All right? And Yah, in the process of time, Yah's going to hide him. He won't let anybody know who he is and where he at, where he's at. Because believe it or not, Satan would go searching for him and try to take him out. He's already trying to take him out with, in Revelation chapter 12. The dragon stood before the woman was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as he was born. I'm, I'm going to take it up. Yeah, I just spoke to me and said, I'm, uh, hold on. The Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the one that causes the atonement, is the scapegoat. Some people say the scapegoat is the devil. How in the world can the one that causes the atonement be the devil? We just read that back there. Let me go back there again one more time before we cut this video. Before we go on with the rest of our day. I don't want to hold you. I'm kind of long-winded. But in this day and time about this topic, it's very important. It's going to be important that you know who this man is because it's going to happen. Let me see if that's going to go to Leviticus again. It's going to happen. It's going to be important that you, you, that you don't go out there fighting with against this man right along with these fools. Okay? It's going to be important that you know who he is. Let me go back down here. He's the one that calls it the atonement. There's a goat. The goat that does offer for sin calls the atonement? No. And yes, Yah does call him his, his son. Where we at? Let 
In the final scripture, it says, the live goat makes the atonement. On the final scripture, it says he told me to atone. I don't want to leave you before I do that. Hello, everybody. We're going to find this thing here. Okay. Let's go to the Leviticus 16. Atonement is all throughout the scriptures. So, the reason why yeah, so adamant about it because he's gonna make an atonement. So was atonement made at? It's made on Mount Zion. Amazing. It was right there in the word, but I keep passing up. Maybe I'm getting too much in a rush. Hmm. 
Yeah, there it is. Verse 10, I got to remember that. But the goat on which the lot failed to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before Yahweh. Like we was talking about, he's going to be presented alive. Like, when is that going to happen? When he forms the mountain in the air with his own power and flies upon it, that's when that, that ceremony is going to be complete. Because remember, the goat appears before Yahweh alive. The same Yahweh that Moses could not look at in his face, otherwise he would have died. But this goat will appear and will see Yahweh alive. He will see his face. This goat is really a human being. Just like the goat for sin offering is Yahweh Shai, the scapegoat is a human being in the latter days, and I believe he is the ancient of days. He's going to appear, he's going to be presented, shall be presented alive before Yahweh to make an atonement with him to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. And the wilderness is this place over here, Azarus, that the Bible, that 2nd Azarus chapter 13 speaks about. So he would be over here. And it says this goat is the one that makes the atonement. But the goat on which the lot failed to be the scapegoat should be presented alive before Yahweh to make an atonement with him. So the day of atonement, the ultimate fulfillment of it is the same thing that has something to do with the Yom Teruah has something to do with this, this man right here, this person, whoever he's going to be. God is going up with a shout, Yahweh with the sound of a trumpet. Psalm 47. No man has ascended to heaven, but he that first came down, he that descended from heaven, even the son of man which is in heaven. All right. So I hope you all got it. If you didn't get it fully, then... uh. Because let me let me see if I can handle this, say this correctly. That the there was a man a few years ago that was saying that he was the comforter. You read in Isaiah 63, the comforter, the one that we know of as the as the Holy Spirit, is the angel of Yahweh also. When Yahweh Shai died on the cross and rose again, he made room for the comforter, the angel of Yahweh to come down to descend from heaven. So who was that son of man that descended from heaven? It had to be the angel of Yahweh, the very one that showed up in the burning bush and led Moses through the wilderness that said that he was God, that said that he was Yahweh. And that read uh, Exodus chapter three, the angel says he's God, he's Yahweh, he's Allah. All right, so the angel of Yahweh in Isaiah 63 says the same thing. That God, he was the angel of Yahweh's presence. He, he dwelt with the people all throughout the wilderness. So in the same way, when Yahweh Shai died on the cross and rose again, this angel, which is Yahweh, would dwell with the saints that were in Christ until the end. And in the end, he would become a human being. All right? He would become a human being. That's what he told Moses. I am that I am. That word is higher. This means to become. So in the, in the latter day, when he delivers Israel from this latter day Egypt, he will become. Only now he that let it will let until be taken out of the way. Who is that one that lets until be taken out of the way? That per, that word right there is Ganomahi, which means to become. The same word that Haya means in Hebrew, to become. So what happens? This angel of Yahweh that descended from heaven after Yahweh said rose from the dead in Matthew 28, is going to become the son of man. He's going to become the ancient of days. Great is the mystery of godliness. God manifests in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels preaching to the Gentiles, received up into glory. He's the one that he's the one that get, he's the one that descends into heaven. All right. I know it's kind of hard to believe, but that's what this day of atonement is all about. It's going to be fulfilled in the latter days. All right, everybody. Shalom. Let me get out of here.